We were born for one thing, baby. We pray to the heaviest matter of the universe on an ocean planet where dragons dwell. Where whales fly from Mars to Sirius, out in the wilderness with the fortitude and backbone to feel only pain during global warming. Let us teach you about the art of dying. Adoration for none, except Gojira. It's our Gojira album ranking episode, mofos, and that's what I'm trying to say. Are you ready, David? That was hella gay and hella impressive. Hella gay and hella impressive. <laughs> I'm, I'm equally <laughs> astonished and like, what the fuck, at the same time. Uh, this but, is, but hell yeah, dude. Hell yeah. Whales and trees. <laughs> uh, that was, and I really love Gojira. So this is an episode we've honestly talked about doing for a very, very, very long time. Oh, yeah. It's one of the when we were talking about doing the album ranking concept was like one we were going to build to, but then now life happened and they're you know Olympic superstars and such. Yeah, so I feel like this is the time, and uh, I don't know, like I guess I could go and say it now. This is episode twenty. I guess of the, the heavy haystack podcast, like album ranking episode number three. Oh, what a disgusting opening! Yeah, it's. Uh, I'll figure out where to put the intro song. Somewhere opening ceremony this. of the Olympics over opening of this heavy haystack pod any day. That is a very true thing. That for that matter. Uh, yes, it's the album ranking episode, our third one. Uh, in case you hadn't listened to this podcast, which given it's been a year, one we really enjoyed doing, and another one we didn't enjoy doing quite as much, even though we love both bands. Oh, uh, because like yes, the first one we did was Mastodon. That was back on episode ten, uh, and then we did one on Municipal Waste, which was episode twelve. I can't talk about Municipal Waste anymore without referencing that episode to people. I'm like, <laughs> dude, I love Municipal Waste, but. Uh, don't no. listen to all their albums in like three days <clears throat> yeah they're, they're a small doses type of thing but gojira is one not you with a, a critical not with a critical fucking thought no this is let's turn your brain off one this is like you got to do a lot of thinking with gojira here uh, yeah a lot of feeling a lot of feeling a lot of feeling it's, it's thinking man's metal as one might say uh gojira and now, some I just realized that, like, usually, the thing I was thinking of was starting this, like, episode off with giving a little mini bio. But if you clicked on this episode, you probably know who Gojira is. They're uh, French. They are very French. That's pretty much what everybody points out. I mean, that's... It's just like they have to tell people they're French. I mean, how many metal bands do you know from France? Ultra Vomit. I might have heard that name before. I like to vomit, vomit. Uh, uh, that one. <laughs> and then, uh... There's a band back in the day called Hack Ride. It was pretty cool. Hack Ride. But to be fair, the only reason I checked out any French bands beyond is, Gojira. is that Gojira existed. And I was like, oh, there's metal in France. I know two other metal bands from France that are not Gojira. And that would be Benighted, who's uh, some brutal death metal. That's, yeah, that's good shit. They're quite quality good stuff. And also a band called uh, Mass Hysteria, which does like kind of industrial metal stuff. Uh, like That was like popular in the early 2000s and such. Okay. Uh, they got this one song called Furia, which sounds like it's in Spanish, which is a little weird considering they're French, but it's borders France borders Spain. It might be from some area to where Gojira is. They have an auntie. <laughs> they have an auntie that inspired them. An, an auntie? A uh, Spanish auntie. Spanish auntie. I don't know. Maybe. I was just thinking like, I was like, oh, this sounds cool. Like he's hearing a metal band so like, do it singing in Spanish. Like, where are they from? France. Huh. That was weird. No, uh, you know, there's a lot of people out there way more cultured than a couple of Kentucky dudes. <laughs> uh, that is that is very true. I sing in yeehaw. Sing in yeehaw. We speak yeehaw. We speak twang. That that's our that's our what we say. Um, <laughs> what was that? We are what we say. That is what we are. What we say. We are. What we say. I don't fucking know. It's late. I'm fucking. I'm just winging this shit. Here. I know. I was waiting for Dante to be like, "Hey, I'm home. You were ready to do this thing," and then I finally text him at like you know, a little after nine o'clock. I was like, "Eh." 
I was and he's like, I'm here waiting, ready for when you are. I'm like, well, how am I supposed to know you ready when I am? When well, I've got to come we were, to your house to record the damn thing. You knew we were recording today. I was waiting for you. I was just eating from some bourbon and Toulouse. I was <laughs> eating some stuffed taco shells. That was pretty sweet. Well, we both got food in our bellies, and now it's time to talk about Zemetto. I know. I passed out for about 25 minutes, too. Of course. I woke up. I was like, oh, shit. And I still didn't have no text from me. I was like, God damn it. Well, now I know. Well, we haven't done this. This is the Now only you know topic. if somebody's coming to your house, you might want to tell them you are home. To be fair, no one really comes to my house. <laughs> like, so that's, oh, I'll come in your house, too. Jesus Christ. <laughs> anyway, uh, the thing we're talking about today is the band Gojira. Passionately. Passionately. A little, I'll, I'll come in their house, too. Jesus Christ. <laughs> a little bit about Gojira, a little mini bio about Gojira for those of you who, for some reason, clicked on this episode, maybe just because you love us, but you don't know that much about Gojira. But Gajira was founded as a metal band from France that was founded in 19... 19- We've established that part. Yes, yes, we have. They are a metal band from France that was founded in 1996 in Andres, uh, France, uh, which is in the southwest part of France, two blocks away from a beach, pretty much. Uh, known f- it's in an area of uh, southwest France in the Bayonne area, known for its surfing uh, and having a lot of forest area, which probably inspired a lot of Gajira songs. I mean, I'd be a hippie, too. Yeah, I mean, you live next to your beach out in nature. It's everything's really nice as a forest. I was born in as close to the thing as the big city as Kentucky had, besides Louisville, obviously. Yeah, but there's two big cities in Kentucky, and I still fell in love with <laughs> trees and whales. <laughs> well, we don't have many whales here in Kentucky, but we do uh, got a lot of trees. <laughs> but <laughs> never mind. <laughs> anyway, like there's they, some big old women in San Antonio, Kenny. That, I know it's Charles Barkley reference. Nah, dude, I'm, I'm going deep. <laughs> no, nah, yeah. Charles Barkley literally would just make fun of how many big women were in San Antonio all the time. That's a thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It was like a big montage. <laughs> There's always some big... Uh, Victoria's a secret down there, Kenny. They wear bloomers. <laughs> yeah. Basketball references on a good year podcast. <laughs> hey, dude. We're, we're cultured for two uh, Kentucky dudes. God. Uh, yeah, Good Year was founded in 1996 in Andres, France. And... They had to change their name in 2001 to Gojira. Uh, well, they originally named Godzilla. So, but they changed the name to Gojira for legal reasons because Japanese are very so happy. Uh, yeah, Toho. Because of copyright. Toho does not like their cash cow. Uh, apparently, that's just Japanese companies in general because anime stuff, they're really strict on that shit. Too. Which is crazy because there's bands like Gigan and uh, there's a, quite a few Ghidorah bands out there. I mean, speaking of which, uh, this past week, I know this isn't a news episode, but a band called Oxygen Destroyer just released a record this past Friday. Yeah, they, they're they good because the reference is a little more obscure, but I mean, the ones that just straight up named the band, or name, named the monsters with the band name, I'm, I'm still quite curious why Godzilla, I mean, it might just be the uh, international copyright Maybe. and how much money Godzilla versus the word Gojira pulls in yeah there's a lot and of you know the fact that i guess all the other monsters maybe are just subsects of that cash cow but yeah like i said japan and toho very much so on their copyright shit but i still don't quite understand it because there's other metal bands that because i'm pretty sure there's a mothra band out there somewhere too probably uh, like someone's named us off of the mothra yeah so uh, but gigan's the other biggest one i can name that i think is named after a toho monster gigan uh, yeah, and two, as they've had the same lineup since 2001 as well, which is also very surprising for a lot of bands as long-lived as they are. Well, I mean, when two brothers like each other, and they like their friends. That's true. I mean, of course, the two brothers would be in the band the whole time, but having the same uh, other members as well is pretty uh, pretty a feat. Uh, they had a different uh, basis before their current one, like when they first started, but that's the only lot of change they had. But since 01, it's been the same quartet of Joe DePlantier on lead vocals and rhythm guitar, Mario DePlantier, his brother, in case you couldn't tell, on drums, Christian Andrew on lead guitar, and Jean-Michael Labadi on bass. See, uh, I don't know how you actually say all those names. <laughs> I'm assuming that's how you say the names. It sounded French enough to me. I would say I've always kind of leaned with Andreu, but I don't know about that one. I mean, it could be Andreu. And Andrei. I've always went with Labadee. I know it's not that. Yeah. That doesn't sound right. <laughs> but, I mean, I was very hard on the Duplanteur and not Duplantier, <laughs> too. So. I, yeah, I was saying Duplanteur at first, and I was like, oh, they're French, so it's like Duplantier. Duplantier. <laughs> well, you know. 
They're splitting hairs. There's, <laughs> it just goes with the it depends classic, on where your country you're from. You know, the the Gojira uh, Godzilla fucking references here. <laughs> uh, you know, when there's a monster named Ang- Anguirus, and they were like, "Oh, it's Anguirus, it's Anguinus." You've heard it every single way you could possibly hear it in all the movies. Oh, uh, it's a lot of all the different like odd uh, ways you could probably say that one. So, but I'm pretty sure they prefer their names to be said right. But as much as I love this band, uh, outside of the Duplantier brothers, I've not ever quite heard the other two names get said <laughs> like uh, don't they don't know. get interviewed a lot so Not a lot all i know is that uh freaking uh the lead guitarist there christian he's uh big into gardening when he's not on tour <laughs> that's a very fucking good year i think to, to do garden. i think the basis is big into mountain biking as well <laughs> he, he he looks like a mountain biker <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but the band had trouble early in their career finding a label and management being deemed too ambitious for their music style. Uh, they, Which is kind of crazy because I've heard like the OG demo tapes and it's pretty much just fucking as stripped down death metal as it got. Yeah, I heard like one demo I was when I was researching. A possessed. Yeah, like the uh, best one. It just yeah, sounds got- like kind of just straight up. Dun, 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 yeah. dun, so it's stuff. crazy that that's what they consider too ambitious because... As we'll get into it, the ambition only went up from there, for sure. Yeah. They were told that uh, you should abandon your death metal sound and sing in your native French. And uh, to that, Gojira, since you said, fuck that, and took a DIY approach to their music career. They uh, started producing their own records. They built their own studio in like a log cabin out in the woods. Uh, their first studio, whose name I didn't write down, but it was like, uh, it was some weird name. Start with an L. Um, that they started in France. And that's where they recorded their all their like demos and uh, their first early album, their second album, The Link. They recorded there. They went to a studio in Brussels uh, for Terra Incognita, their first full record that they did. Uh, and then like they didn't start getting international attention until they signed to the French indie label Listenable Records uh, and released from Mars to Sirius on their third record through them and got a North American deal prosthetic. with prosthetic records. And that's when like they started like they started beating stuff in the English metal scene. It was the first time they started playing out of France was on that record cycle. Yeah, and it was funny though, because like it didn't happen like right away either. I think that album had came out let's see what's the actual year on that. You said two thousand five or yeah, two thousand five. I think it took about a year before they got to the states to tour on that. Yeah, I think it was 2004 when they signed with with Listenable, and it was like the year after they started doing that. And they like got them connected with like the UK metal scene. Kerrang! Like had a party that had like a bunch of international bands at it, and that's where they started meeting other like other international bands. Well, and then like specifically from that time period, which I talked a little bit on the last episode, Revolver, which was pretty much. I would say at the time the biggest publication in in the states uh, that was consistently putting out metal news and stuff like that. They got featured in like three or four editions in a row, and each feature was like more and more important. So like the initial feature was like a single page, like cut out. Like I said, I said that on the last one, where it's like the interview and whatever had a little did you know blurb about their name deal or whatever that they had to deal with yeah um i think in the order that i remember it in the next edition was the top 20 25 whatever records of the year yeah and it came in i believe at like number three or four which compared to who they were on that list with i think they were kind of out of nowhere i feel like that might have been this well maybe not quite the same year as sacrament but I'd have to look back specifically Sacrament to tell. Sacrament was in... They were really high on that list. I think it was 2005 when Sacrament came out. Say they were no, it was 2006. That's well, what it was. Yeah. either way, they were really, really, really high on this list of, uh, like I said, best albums of the year. And then the edition after that uh, had like a full interview. And I remember it was just like kind of that beating over my head is how I really was like, all right, well, I'm going to go check this band out. And I went to the local disc jockey. It used to be in Lexington Green. If oh, anybody, I remember disc jockey. I was say if anybody local remembers that. And there was two copies of From Ours is Serious in the entire store. And if you remember disc jockey, if it was like a new release from like a pretty prominent band, there'd be like fucking 
30 of them or 20 of them. There'd be a fuck ton of albums. It was just obscure little band from France. So I was felt kind of lucky to even find it. And, uh, you know, I don't want to go too far into detail beyond that just because that's getting in the, the territory of what we need to get into once we start ranking these albums. But, uh, so yeah, that's just my timeline kind of finding what this Gojira thing was. And I remember distinctly that Randy from Lamb of God was in the press harping hardcore on them too. Like being like, dude, this is a fucking band everybody needs to check out. Um, so they got the biggest endorsement they could probably That's possibly get it, outside of like, you know, Slipknot or something. But Randy at the time being. I mean, Randy Bly in like the mid 2000s. That's as big of a ring nah. like cosign you can get. So they, they got that endorsement from him. And I remember that being in Revolver mm-hmm. as well. And just I don't remember interviews and, you know, him wearing the merch and shit. Like he, he started pushing that band super hard as soon as he discovered it. And I think that was really where the breakthrough happened. Because if I recall, it's like they're too f- big like north american tours they started off with one was lamb of god and machine head and i think Tribune was on most of that date before they kind of veered off to go to europe with maiden um but i think the other one was the uh fuck now i'm gonna fucking forget it i think it was job for a cowboy beneath the massacre gojira and behemoth or something That's crazy it was like another one of the publications or it might have been like a decibel tour or something but I remember like the first big they were featured on that. <clears throat> I remember the first big uh show that they had outside of France uh was on Download Tour where they were asked to replace Mastodon on Download Festival uh in two thousand five or six, I believe it was. And uh speaking of like a big that's like a big spot to take over to take over for Mastodon during that time period because this was the right year of before Leviathan. yeah, it was like the year before is when they released Leviathan and mm, right. for them to step into that spot uh is a pretty big deal, which got him a lot of exposure in the Europe, European metal scene. Uh, which that was gonna, I was like, you already gave a little bit of background on what I was gonna do for like the next section of like how each of us got into the band. Oh, well, uh, my bad. I was just, I skipped ahead. Like, basically, there's not much more to like the bio, the Gojira. primitive, the primitive years. Yeah. Of course, that was like the early years of Gojira. Of course, like they broke through uh, internationally with From Mars to Sirius. They released uh, follow up albums, which just kept getting more accolades on, like, on top of that with like The Way of All Flesh in 2008, I believe that was. And then La Font Sauvage uh, in 2012, followed by Magma in 2016, and Fortitude in 2021. And all the way up to today, where they're recognized as one of the most beloved and respected metal bands in all of the world now, and having their penultimate moment possibly today with like uh, getting on to the 2024 Olympics opening ceremony, being exposed to 30 million people worldwide. Yeah, the only people that I ever hear hate on Gojira are extra crusty, like the super hardcore black metal. Like if your album cover isn't just black and white, you can eat a dick. Yeah, <laughs> out of all the bands, there's like two bands, and really in all of like heavy music in general that like I hear don't get much hate, and that's essentially Gojira and Alice in Chains. Like those are the two acts I hear like not many people hate on. Uh, nah, I mean, there's a few more that don't get as much as others, but like I said, as, as for as high as Gojira has gotten, for sure, yeah, like for being that popular, the, so the like, hate no. hasn't been as deep as I thought it would be. I mean, like I said, I've definitely heard some, but that's just any band that size is going to get some. But for the most part, I mean, a lot of people stuck with them. Um, I mean, I've stuck with them immensely, and like I said, I'll get into more details as we go here. But yes. uh, yeah, now like I said, it's their pretty enduring and their their level of popularity has only continuously risen they really haven't had that like leap forward where they fell you know and try to climb back up they've been consistently honestly just chipping away getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and and there's a few bands like that out there that really to me it's like the blueprint of everything you want to do is just you know fuck no matter where you're starting from just grow 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 and don't worry too much about all the fucking other shit that can happen. Just you can say they've been grinding and grinding. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can. <laughs> yes, you can. Uh, well, the way that I got into Gear, I was as I am with many metal bands. I uh, was late to the party. Uh, I didn't really listen to Gojira at all, or even have heard of them until about twenty fifteen or sixteen. 
uh, a little bit before magma was releasing uh the way that i've the first gojira's material that i heard was uh, some songs from their la font sauvage album like the wild child Yes, the wild child, <laughs> uh, which came up on a Spotify playlist for me on just suggestions. I think the very first song I ever heard was the axe off that record. And, uh, and which then, for reference, everybody, it's like, well, you didn't find him out that late. It's like he wasn't. I mean, you got into our band in what, 2017? Yeah, 2017. And you. Yeah. So as far as that was before I was reviewing records, too. I was say as far as your exposure into like a lot, a lot, I'm sure that you know as you went there yeah like during that time period i was like still in like metalcore land i knew like of course like the big name band most of the big name bands i was like aware of their name but yeah. i haven't just like got in like took a chance on listening to them yet and essentially like, i listened to like those two like songs and i was it didn't click with me at first because it was i was like just dipping my toes into proggy stuff at the time uh but what really got me was Spotify used to have this series on um, their uh, on their uh, app called uh, Talking Metal, where they would have like these like it was essentially like a playlist they would have on Spotify, where it would like intersperse interviews with the band with songs that they were talking about in the interviews, and that's how I discovered. And this was like in promotion for the Magma album, and that's kind of how I, like I, I heard about them first. Heard about their upcoming in France and just hearing that there was a metal band that was prominent for France was interesting and the first song that really hooked me into them was uh the title track for La Font Sauvage actually and uh, that was the first song that I was like oh this band's something here like I have like lot and I'm probably pronouncing it wrong La Enfant Sauvage uh the wild child in English uh that was the first one I was like oh this band's got something and then the Magma album came out and that's like where I first started like becoming a fan of them a little bit uh, and like now, like for both of us, they're among, definitely Gajira's ranks among our favorite bands. I don't know for you, possibly. It's, re- one. it's really hard for me to not just point to the longevity and how much I've liked them and how much I feel like their music has evolved with my taste as well. Mm. That um, I can't really point to a band that I've stuck with that hard. And there's been. And we'll talk about it. There's been like maybe there's one time in particular where I felt like, all right, this is it. It's over. They're, <laughs> they're going to suck now. And it quickly kind of got past that. Uh, but yeah, now for, for a band that I've had a going on close to 20 year relationship with, <laughs> which is a long time. <laughs> yeah. For, for, like I said, I'm a, I'm a brisk 32. So, you know, that's a lot of my formative years listening to that band. And, uh, like I said, they were honestly probably my gateway into the heavier realm. Like truly like where I was just like, didn't understand why I loved all of it at the time. And, you know, when you're taking a, the kid, uh, that was listening to eighties metal and all that. And, you throw a record on and you're like holy shit that's the heaviest shit i ever heard it kind of kind of pushes the envelope for you and like i said kind of opened up my world uh so to speak so it's cool that they opened me up and but they stayed as relevant as ever throughout that entire process so yeah like a lot of bands like going through the sonic transition that gojira has usually it's hard to maintain the level of quality and really fan in- engagement and like enjoyment that they've had uh it's a hard thing to accomplish, especially in the metal world where metal fans are the most fickle motherfuckers you've ever seen in your life. Yeah. Uh, this is, that's like, I'd say that's pretty good for the precursor. Uh, essentially, this is, we'll let y'all know how this album ranking goes, considering you haven't done this in a while. Uh, essentially, we are both, each of us, me and David, ranking our top five albums from Gojira. Go so, five well, to one. Yes. Going in ascending order from our fifth favorite to our number one favorite each. Uh, if both of our choices happen to be on the same number, we well, can just both openly discuss it as we do. But whoever's pick it is, like we'll just let them have the floor essentially to kind of like describe why the album is in that spot and the things that like stand out about it and like about it. Uh, would you, who wants to go first? Do you want to go first with the number five or? I reckon, first? given uh, my track record, I'll go ahead and uh, shoot my load first. <laughs> 
Do, do you have to phrase it like that? Uh, I'm going to come in your house, Dante. You're already in my house, but you don't have to say it. Oh, <laughs> you well, just came in my house. Well, I'm coming, baby. Uh, you're coming. Okay. Number five. Number five for David. What is your fifth favorite album from the band? We no don't have to go, go very far back in time. Uh, this is going to be the latest release in 2021, Fortitude. Fortitude, the most recent album from them. And this this might be like reverse recency bias. Because... <laughs> uh, when I fucking really got into this record, I got it, it. It was strong. I mean, fuck, it starts off super fucking strong. Uh, some of my favorite singles, like new singles, fucking have come out for any of these albums. Born for one thing. I remember another world came came out. Probably I think was the first one, right? And that was the first single released in the year they before. Anyway, they say they out. didn't even say that that was attached to an album. Yeah, it just I'm came out. Alone. And These then, videos dope too. And then Amazonia, I think, was the third one. If I if I remember correctly, yes. But like all those singles stood out, um, their progression as a band really kind of stood out. Like it, they took, they brought it back to a certain level as well as pushing the envelope further. Um, like the songs, uh, you know, you were making the grinding and grinding and grinding. <laughs> I would say that's a very uh, like step forward type of song. Whereas you know, songs like amazonia and like sphinx or sphinx bow, 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 and bow, fucking, bow, bow, uh, bow. grind really take it back it's a good mix of their entire career in one single album um i will say that <sighs> this is where it gets hard when you're talking about ranking something when you enjoy everything because my one through seven is probably separated by like 1.25 points like on any it's scale. very marginal like difference yeah so like uh, seven to one it's really fucking hard so like really I, and like i said this might be reverse recency bias it might be their newest one so i'm docking it a little bit because like when i'm looking through the record and i'm just looking through the track and just thinking and i was i was i had this conversation with before, before we started where i was like if i wanted to go see them live how many songs realistically on each album would i want to see and this has just as many as any of them. It's like I said, Born for One Thing, Amazonia, Another World. I love Hold On. Uh, Fortitude Into the Chant is fucking gorgeous. I I loved the chant when it came out. Because um, it, it's different from anything they've ever done, too. Yes, they just kind of took the old classic rock and roll, let's go whoa a little bit and make whoa, everybody sing whoa, along. Yeah. That is pretty dope live. Yeah. I got to sing along with that. And then... Uh, like I said, a couple of the tracks, like Into the Storm, the trails, kind of take them, leave them, go to your tracks. Very fucking solid. Sphinx and Grind. Like, Grind's another one. Just heard them do that a lot. So, you know, it is what it is. So maybe it's just, it tapers off a little bit at the end for me. And like I said, I may be devaluing it because it's the most recent one uh, instead of overinflating it because we've gotten some time in between it being released, too. Yes. But because let me actually be perfectly clear. For me, this top five is top five as of today. <laughs> yeah, like, honestly, like, this I shares for me all the fucking time because I will fall in love. There's actually, once we get in the next couple for me, those are ones I didn't necessarily expect to be where they were either. Once I really started thinking about this and breaking it down. So I'm just precursor and all that. Anything I'm saying negative, remotely negative about any of these albums isn't really a fucking negative as much as it me trying to nitpick a ranking out of it so um like i said this album's fucking phenomenal <laughs> <laughs> and I, I highly enjoy it um amazonia might be one of my favorite songs you talk about amazonia yeah. kind of all the fucking time to be yeah honest. no i fucking love it i love the video with the fucking tribal people and like i said it's like he he hits one note in that song that's more effective than any guitar solo uh coming Boom. out of the Whee! Yeah. yeah that does hit pretty hard I yeah <laughs> so and then you know fucking like the imagery at the end of the another, another world when they like travel into the whatever space time they go through and then they see like france in the future all torn up and fucked up and like because they it, it, with me as i say with me all these videos are very distinct too like the born for one thing video with them in the museum and shit's like super fucking cool that song's fucking a crazy opener too. Like the ending is so fucking tight. I was just surprised Mario wore a shirt in that like, video. I could really just go on and on, but this is number five, and I should probably let you talk a little bit because uh, <laughs> I'm probably only going to talk more as we go about each of these. I albums. know that you could talk. You can talk like solo. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty well. 
So I'll let this one, I'll let this one sit. But yeah, now number five for me is Fortitude. And like I said, I don't know, maybe another year or two, it could be back in my top two or three. Like it's, it's phenomenal in its own right. I just think right now I've settled it in a nice spot. (laughs) Oh, yes. Fortitude, that is like the newest one. Uh, it's pretty, it's like, it's a, it's a fair spot, I'd say, for number five. Uh, for me, uh, also like, like all Spreaker, so like for me there's also no bad go to your albums uh and my list could like switch or alter pretty much at any time depending on the day the week the month the year <clears throat> as i was like researching and re-listening through all these albums uh, i don't have as long of a history with the band as david does uh but it's still like as i was listening through like the albums the ranking that i had didn't end up where i thought it would be for a lot of the albums uh, in a similar fashion, and also, uh, also very liable to change as well, depending on like if we did this one in like another a month, even it could be something different. <laughs> but my number five that I decided to go with, uh, after a whole lot of delib- like who and how and deliberating, uh, my number five is their 2008 album, The Way of All Flesh. Uh, that is their fourth album that uh, followed their uh, critical and commercial breakthrough from Mars to Sirius. And well, this works out a little bit because that's my next one. <laughs> uh, well, this was like it was a little background. Like I like look a little bit of like background details for like all the albums and the lists and all that. Uh, it was produced by Logan Mater, who of former Machine Head fame as their lead guitarist and also currently for the band Once Human. If you're familiar with them, uh, and deals with themes of like life and death is uh, which is common to a lot of Gojira records, but this is like something they said outright for this one. Uh, and for this one, like the Wave All Flesh, I think uh, this is one of the ones I didn't dive into that deep, like before researching for this podcast. I knew the big songs from it, uh, like songs like Ouroboros, The Art of Dying, Vacuity, uh, My and Toxic Garbage Island, which is my favorite song from this album. Uh, really, like, if I had to pick a top three Gojira songs, which also is one that changes a lot, too, honestly, depending on the day. Yeah, this is a volatile exercise. <laughs> but uh, Toxic Garbage Island is, like, one of my favorites. It's easily in my top three favorite Gojira songs because it has one of the most memorable riffs and my favorite drum performance from Mario the Planter uh, as well because it's just fucking insane. It's just, like, a riff that instantly hits you and gives you that what-the-fuck feeling. Of like, what the fuck am I listening to? What is this? Like the th- thing, like especially that song. Really, a lot of their songs, but that song in particular. Uh, the Gojira accomplishes something where it's like you know how industrial metal, where it's all like electronic and sounds like it's like put to a grid and super, uh, like machine like and punishing and like exact. They do that with no electronics. And they do it just with just the normal setup of guitars, bass, just drums. Brother Mojo, baby. Essentially. And they're just like, they're just locked in like motherfuckers. But really, like, I know I can harp on that particular song, but this whole album is interesting because it's, uh, it feels like it has a darker vibe to its predecessor, uh, like from Mars to Sirius. And also, it feels like this one really should have been the album that followed their second record, The Link. Cause it seems like, like, they because like style wise because i feel like it has like more in common with that record than it does for mars the serious on this one they started going into they started getting real explorative with their like atmospheric stuff and going into post-metal territory getting leaning on those neurosis type vibes uh especially on the more atmospheric songs like uh like yama's messengers and some like certain other i think uh, esoteric surgery i think well it has six surgeries a heavier one uh, but, they stay pretty heavy on this album for the yeah. most part. The Silver Chords got like a little chill interlude. A sight to behold has like the uh, electronic voice going on. Yeah, and speaking of like guest spots, of course, like uh, Randy Bly from Lamb of God is featured on the Adoration for None track, uh, doing a nice little guest performance there. Uh, but yeah, this one leaned heavy into atmospherics. This was one that I had to like really. St- I probably I'm glad I listened to it deeper now because it's. A record where you have to have that prog metal patience to really like get into some of the deeper cut tracks on this one uh, because it gets like real atmospheric, real like vibe focused for a lot of the deeper cuts on this. But it still has a lot of heaviness to make it the accessible by metal fan standards. Uh, 
and it's really just has like a lot of like standout tracks on it uh that i think were really good uh essentially like this one i can understand it being someone's number one i can understand it being like someone's like less lesser favorite album on this one uh but it has a lot of like unique standouts like ouroboros just has that like windy needly riff and that's a pretty interesting uh, yeah, intro the, the, the tapping if yeah. you want to get on the technical term there yeah like the old like winning and winning and winning like it's it's good Joe's has like pretty interesting choices for album intro songs their tapping sounds very fucking like sloppy but it ends up tight as fuck like it's <laughs> wobbly like a lot of like tapping when you think about it is you know fucking van halen precise crazy shit yeah they do it like on the rhythm parts and like it's always baffled me how like much they execute that because like i said it just they're they're it's on wobblier strings they're not as tight so it's like you you get that but like they fucking are tight on it i mean i've seen all those songs live and i'm like holy shit like <laughs> anything they tap in like that it's just like like i said i've seen ouroboros a few times in person and it always baffles me how fucking phenomenal they keep a tapping part like that going which I me mean, could say that about a lot of their parts that when it comes to endurance and <laughs> clarity yeah, like and like they're so like because they're Gojira's, i mean they're like generally known as a prog band but they're also known for their tech death like influences and their groove metal influences and they make it like prog and technical but accessible because they always have the sense of groove into like all of their stuff which is uh i think that's like kind of like what helps them have that mass appeal they do for a lot of like metal people yeah because there's a little something for everybody well and so i reckon i'll go ahead and just cover my number four and you can chime in if you want there because right, right. this is the you know this is the album um uh, david's I, number four also yeah, is way yeah. off flesh. well that's also awesome. my number four is number four your number five is way off flesh but yeah. it just happens to be back to back so yeah. my number four is something different but we'll get to but that. uh so yeah this was like the one i had the hardest time with uh because it was either going to be number four or number three uh because this one just brings back fucking myspace memories oh my oh dial up internet yeah. vacuity pops up on the how you said? Vacuity, vacuity vacuity i don't know whatever vacuity. english i think it's vacuity. motherfuckers do you <laughs> speak it but i don't know i've always said vacuity but that like I said again vacuity vacuity vacuums hoover i don't give a shit <laughs> now but uh but now nah, so that song dropped and i remember again the dial up internet era so i had to wait forever for this brand new song to buffer <laughs> oh god and buffering of tracks and i remember once i got it to buffer i probably listened to it a hundred thousand times over and over and over and over and over again like i fell in love with that fucking single so hard for uh actually this this album cover is was my first tattoo oh, the one on your calf yeah me and my sister got got it matching on my 18th birthday so nice um i love this record clearly and at a time it would have been like probably when it came out i've been like oh it's number one it's the greatest thing i ever heard oh my god you know because it's the first new gojira record i was waiting on it's the first like the anticipation of that and i remember I mean, literally, I just have my fucking mind blown because, again, you were talking about Ouroboros with that fucking opening track, the just the, straight into the Tappy Riff, Toxic Garbage Island with that fucking offbeat shit in the beginning. And I want to learn how to fucking, play that fucking track. <laughs> like, oh, my God. Nut. Um, and I never knew that plastic <laughs> bag at us. Yeah, that's like that would be so metal. How's like the hardest fucking line ever and it's <laughs> plastic bag in the sea. Uh cuz it's Gojira. Yeah. Uh a sight to behold. I fucking it reminded me of like old fucking computer games for some reason. Just that fucking Yeah, I thought nah. the same thing cuz I, yeah, like, I was like I'm why I'm playing I Wolfenstein like on the c- computer, you why? know. This feels like I'm in the sewer level of a yeah. Crash Bandicoot game or something. And so like that always fucking resonated with me. I love that fucking song. Uh it's sort of weird when they like do institute their like electronic y s- production stuff. Like they do that on some Well, that's another too. song that's got cool tapping parts. Like oh. they 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 break into that and like the I guess you would call it the chorusy part. Um fucking and then the way that song ends fucking they just this song like this album 
you were talking about the atmosphere, but like when they go abrasive, it's abrasive as fuck, and it's awesome. Like I, I fucking like I can't say enough about a lot of the songs on this record. And again, like this is where it gets really hard when you're talking about the ranking. Cause I'm going to sound like this should be like my favorite album ever. Every but, album, favorite but like, album. You know, it goes back to the fucking music videos. Like even like, you know, vacuity, vacuity, however the fuck you say it. <laughs> um, you know, I just remember like the imagery of like, you know, the songs breaking down and this chick's holding a fucking, she's literally carrying a fucking coffin by a chain, but the coffin like, gets connected in through her stomach. And she's like naked hanging off the side of this waterfall, like as the coffin falls off and it drags her off the cliff and shit. And it's just such epic imagery. Uh, then they have like the artsy uh, video for all the tears, which they've done a similar style for videos like uh, Born in Winter for on a, you know, Levant Salvage, just kind of that art style. Infant uh, sausage. Infant sausage. <laughs> but uh, esoteric surgery was always like a favorite one. Gojira has this thing where I don't necessarily like dial in to like the bigger message in a lot of songs, but they'll have like one line that just sticks with me super fucking hard in a lot of songs. Classic, I'm going to say. Uh, yeah, well, that, but like in esoteric surgery, it's just like he just, the opening line is he just literally screams, you have the power to heal yourself. Yeah, that is one that stuck with me as well. And it's just like, like and now there's more examples of that as we go on through here. Uh, there's another big one like uh, later that just kind of ended up just being a mantra almost for me. Um. Yeah, you know that's a fucking legit ass band in your life, and you're talking about them creating mantras for you. <laughs> but, oh yeah, <laughs> but yeah, man, and they, you know, I, I brought up the adoration for none on the last episode, talking about Randy Bly's like guest vocal abilities. Like that song's chaotic and crazy, and it's fucking perfect. We, it's a perfect fucking mix of those two dudes fucking doing their thing. Um, there's one thing they do on this record, and this isn't really. <sighs> quit doing the 12 minute silence at the end just to have some fucking bullshit <laughs> the hidden track yeah like and it's not even a hidden track because it's attached to the last track you know what i mean <laughs> but i that's one weird pet peeve i have it's like it's been done don't do it again stop it well this was still like cd era for like, yeah i know stuff. but like well, that was a cool thing to do still stop it <laughs> i just i never liked that trope for whatever reason but that's like literally only only fucking bad thing i can say um and i know gojira i kind of didn't really point out that fortitude on the last one uh about like their little instrumentals they do on every album yeah something about the silver that. chord might be i mean that's fucking hard too because now that i'm thinking about it I, i'll probably have a more favorite but the silver chords are really good uh, mental middle uh, interlude into the rest of the record, in my opinion, because like I said, all the tears just comes out fucking flying. Adoration for none comes out flying. The art of dying has that slow build up, and it just fucking goes. And Which it's got one of the my favorite riffs in all Gojira history is the end riff in that one. Yeah, they have like every record they do like one. I like to call it a, a one prog epic, especially on early records. They do like one prog epic. On this one, it was uh, the. Well, the Art of Dying was yeah, like big one for this as well, and I think the last title track is also a big one for that, uh, where they just like have like, all right, this is where we start doing like the whole, let's be the prox now, but metal like yeah. it's fun, like one portion. Yeah, because it's crazy, just rhythmic craziness, and with like, that hidden track away of all flesh it makes it seventeen minutes, as I just checked, which yeah, is a little ridiculous. Yeah, nah, fucking fuck that trope, <laughs> eat, eat, eat my ass. But now this one's pretty strong front to back. And it's even got me thinking, like, as I'm talking here, if I made the right decision. But <laughs> I'm going with my gut here uh, that I initially had. It, there, there's, again, this is not a fucking, this is today. But right now, The Way of All Flesh is my number four. So uh, let's move on from The Skeleton Boy. Uh, interesting thing, like, one last word on Way of All Flesh is that uh, at the time of this, uh, like, front man and main lyricist Joe DePlantier here was 30 years old when this album came out. And like as he entered his thirties, he was thinking about uh, his life and his like potential death. He started getting real, uh, what's thinking about his uh, mortality during this part. And we're both older than him now at this stage. Uh, thinking about that, which uh, it's something relatable. Uh, it adds a layer of relatability to like the topics. More on that later. Yeah, for me, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, that was David's number four. My number four. Uh, it was a record that also I got into uh, a bit late. 
uh, in my Gojira journey, uh, which this is one that was actually kind of like pushed by David here, actually, uh, from him playing all the Gojira 90% of the time we're around each other and in a car that has a stereo. And that is uh, their debut album, Terra Incognita. Well, is my, uh, we're, we're pu- pulling a pattern here. <laughs> oh, here's, that's your number three? Yeah. So uh, go ahead and well, say uh, what you guys say. <laughs> <laughs> Terra Incognita is their debut full-length album. Actually, this this one surprises me. but Oh, really? From what I thought you would go. I think there's going to be some surprises. This is the first surprise for me as far as what I thought you you do, right. for sure. Uh, see, Terra Incognita is like they, the debut album they recorded in Belgium. They wrote it over two years, but was recorded in 10 days, which is the which is the very fast recording cycle they had uh, is what part of the thing that spurred them to make their own studio so they could take more time with the records. Uh, an interesting part that I didn't know until I was doing research on for this episode was was that uh, it was written over a two-year period by Joe where he was living at a cabin with just him and his girlfriend in the forest. Uh, where See, they had- I've heard that story, but I didn't. I, I couldn't have told you where it was referenced to. So uh, that's cool. I couldn't find a reference for the story. I'm assuming it was in an interview somewhere. Well, I was just saying, like, what album? Oh, okay. Like, I, I had heard, like, the, the whole concept of him being in a cabin writing shit. But, yeah, but for two years with no electricity and no source of income. So they were, he was just mountain manning it during the writing for this one. God, he's so dreamy. I'm like, <laughs> gotta admit, that's like the most manliest shit ever. I'm like, God, you're so cool. Yeah. <laughs> uh, fire is everything. Literally, <laughs> he needed it. He needed uh, he, it to survive. He had to build his own fire. Like, <laughs> given, I'm, I'm assuming like Southwest France, it's a more, tip, it's like Florida, essentially. It's kind of like the latitude level. So it's yeah. pretty, it's given, uh, the winters were probably weren't too cold, but still, living in a mountain in a forest by yourself, with, well, you with your girlfriend and all that, but that's uh, that's hard. That's a man shit. Yeah, that that just makes Joe so cool. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, Terry I mean, The thing with, that really appeals to this one for me is that Gojira are always like they're a band that's built around riffs a lot of the time, uh, which uh, the, uh, everyone knows like cool riffs from like their heavier songs <laughs> from throughout their career. But when it comes to riffs, this was like when they were early in the career. They were young. They were in their like mid twenties. And this, they still had that like early raw band vibe to them. Riff salad for fucking days. Yes. This is where essentially like from the first track clone that they open up with, it's just the production out of Jill Gatu. This is like the chunkiest fucking guitar tone that it's that chunky, like death metal band with just enough money for good production. It's the fucking proper raw. Yeah. It's the right. It's the raw you want to have. It's not the raw. It sounds like a tin can didn't have money. It's the raw. A, like production value good actually stuff. like super sidebar real quick that was actually a point i was gonna make about way of all flesh mm. that production hasn't aged as good as other productions have mm. uh so that was just a sidebar i wanted to include i for whatever reason i just that that one to me like production wise sonically hasn't fucking held up as much as other ones to me. And I even listen like on headphones on the way over to make sure I wasn't fooling myself into thinking that. <laughs> and it has a little thinner quality. It's not crazy. I, I do different. actually agree. Like as far as like production. So, I'd say that's- and especially listening to this one and struggling with the two, <laughs> like this one, it's just like, how the fuck is this y'all's debut? You know, <laughs> like, yeah, this given, they did record like two or three demos before this. And so they had a little experience recording, but for a full, this is like, this is a slap your dick on the table first full album, and it is amazing sounding for a band this young. I, I've so like I was doing my last like listen through of this just to make sure of where I was putting it, and I just was just at work stank facing the whole time. I was yes. just like, how the f- like? It's crazy what they do rhythmically on this album, and what's crazy is it's not the craziest rhythmic shit they end up doing either. But like, if you're talking about just volume with like rhythmic crazy shit. While including like all the, this album has like everything they do throughout their career in it, but it's just like they focus all those other things throughout the career. And it's all in this package somehow. Yeah, like you got a little taste of what was to come. The songwriting probably wasn't quite there yet, but it's crazy that you got like the most brutal death metal fucking sound of shit, and then you got a song that could have been like a fucking deep cut on a Nirvana record. Yeah, that was like because that was I'm Satan is a lawyer is the track I'm assuming you're yeah because I remember like after you get like the, I fucking love that song. It took me a bit to get in that one because like you could tell Joe's not confident in his like clean vocals yet 
like during that time. He's just kind of spoken the tra- word. That's the charm of it too, though, man. Yeah, they have so many weird parts in the album, like where they do like that weird clean vocal. Uh, fuck, I'm blanking on the song specifically, but there's like one where he just sounds like he's being like thrown around the forest, like, <laughs> and then it's, don't know when away, don't know when away, like ah. Yeah, there's so many parts on this album. For, for, See, like, that's actually the thing that where I talk about the songwriting. You get lost in this album a little bit, and it does almost get long in the tooth. It is like there's a com- one complaint that's been consistent in critiques of Gojira is that like especially on their earlier records that their stuff was a little bit overly long, uh, which really with the quality throughout the career that hasn't been a major problem for me as a listener. But this is like the only album where that's like a little bit of an annoyance where like their album where it's kind of like a little bit long could have been like a little bit tighter. But there's so much quality work here that you don't really think about it too much. No. And uh, back to the instrumental conversation. Yes. I fucking, for whatever reason, I adore. Hello, woo woo. This is woo woo. It's three days from your 50th birthday. <laughs> yada, yada. Uh, and he goes into this weird fucking like tapping solo. Uh, it sounds like, like it's a phone phase. call thing. Yeah. Yeah. That was their uncle. Uh, okay. That, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That was their uncle, like a phone call that their uncle did. Yeah. Uh, I've always adored that for whatever fucking reason. Yeah. They but, were, uh, this was like, hey, like, th- this is like, yeah, we're, we're going to do samples. <laughs> like, they're, they're one of those fans. But uh, starting off. Uh, yeah. Fucking, uh, again, banger opener. <laughs> yeah. Like they all their openers are just they know how to pick a first like song. It's honestly insane cuz it's just like all right, we're going to set the mood and the mood is always set. Like they they're, they're all pretty perfect when I really go back and like you know, go back through my list and think about it. Um I'll never probably see it live because I was talking about the whole concept of like songs I would love to be in a set list, but the song Space Time is fucking easily a top three to five Gojira song for me. Um, when you're talking about just the, the classic pinch harmonic riff into just heavy fucking awesomeness. Yes. Um, Cause I've heard love a couple times live. I do love that song. No pun intended, but pun very <laughs> intended. I just watched the music video for the first time yesterday. Yeah. It's love. trippy as fuck too. It's, very trippy. Um, it's got like the dude, like, it was the first one that had the, the, over the stop million. motion like legs. Yeah. He's running and shit. Yeah, that was the first video they had that was over a million views like ever. And they didn't have another one until I think from the Mars series era. Yeah, um, I would say probably to series itself because they didn't. I don't think I think they only had the one video on that album. Maybe, probably. Yeah, I don't think like there was one on the link either. But neither. I don't think there was. But one. yeah, now like I said, so like. And I didn't mean to fucking bogart this a little bit for me, but <laughs> I, I just, expected there'd be some of that. <laughs> well, I mean, we just ended up on the same albums after I started first, so uh, you yeah. know, this is just the the uh, the the uh, circumstances of the pod. Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, man, like I said, I can't necessarily sit here. Like I'm actually having a hard time pointing out specific songs as I'm looking through the list here to be like, oh yeah, this is a standout. But it's just like as you're going through, and it's just the 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 rhythm changes and the stuff that they do. And like I said, it's just some of the heaviest shit out there. Yeah. This was like a lot of, uh, but it's the most diverse album they probably got, which is crazy to say. Yeah. Like this was, you could tell he had like a little bit of early, a lot of Meshuggah comparisons they got early in the career, but just like the tightness, the technicality and just the brutality of their early guitar style and riffing, uh, given they don't have like the, like, same type of, like vibey groove, but I don't think even Mashuga had that till Obson. Yeah. Uh, well, and we did this uh, comparison, you know, because we were listening to Where the Slime Live on the way to Whitesburg or something, and you know that early Morbid Angel shit is hundred percent up this alley. Oh uh, yeah. Um, they definitely that's Morbid Angel is a band that's a named reference for a lot of the band members. But yeah, you're you're gonna, and, uh, as well as Death. You're gonna you're gonna find. Like I said, the same single quality songs throughout this album as you will others. But the experience of listening to the whole thing, the production of the whole thing. Like I said, I also had the story with this one that I told on the last pod about ordering it from France to, to hear it. Doing some real 
early like metal fan shit. And I've you. always liked it a lot. I won't say I held it in high reg- as high regard as I have it now. But I think every time I go through like well, let me listen to Gojira shit I haven't listened to in a while because I'm such a fan. I do stick with the new shit for a long time. And it's every time I come back to this shit, it's just like, and there was a car ride not long ago where we were listening to stuff and it was just like, fuck. Just like every fucking other minute they're doing a riff change and it's just, that, again, the heaviest shit you fucking ever heard. Yeah, like it should be with, with how much they focus on the riffs here. Just like the, the theme of this album really feels like it's just cool riff, cool riff, cool riff. They didn't have the melodic edge or the like songwriting edge yet, but they definitely had the riffs down. Well, and what's funny though, and we'll get to that uh, s- subject later, they started off on a higher melodic note than they go to initially. Um, so it it's f- funny how the predi- pro- progression worked, and I'll get more into that once I get to my number one and we get to like the 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 more the end of this but yeah um because like i said i think there's more of that here than you'd give it credit for uh because again uh like i said love it's more rooted in the guitar stuff and like you know the vocals aren't necessarily like you know you're sing song melodic but they're very unique um i think they stand out because i he doesn't really ever do that again not in that style uh, he he started figuring out what he wanted to do, especially from third album on. They kind of abandoned the clean vocal, like largely. I mean, there's a bits and pieces here and there, but they kind of abandoned that till, um, really, honestly, magma where the majority of it comes in. Yeah, like the it definitely has where uh, I think he's still trying to figure out his voice because I think it wasn't until like later on in their career from this where he started where Joseph really started feeling confident in his clean vocals or figuring out how, what he wanted to do well, with a melodic vocal. And even then, his screams only got crazy better. Yeah. His screams got better. He started doing the screaming in key thing, which something in a lot of metal, like, I don't know if you're, if you're aware of this, but usually, like, the whole screaming in key approach was something that uh, in today's metal was often attributed to uh, Sam Carter of Architects. Uh, but listening to this early stuff, realized that Joe no, has been that, around. Uh, it's been, it's around. been around like way earlier with his stuff, which I don't know if Gojira you know, is an influence on Architects at all. Uh, it would it would make sense because they really their influences was Dillinger Escape Plan early on, yeah. who probably also pulled from similar circles as Gojira. If you listen to like Dillinger, you probably listen to some Gojira too, because uh, you're into like out there metal. Uh, but but f- yeah, for a debut. By all means, like if you want a rundown of everything you're going to hear in Gojira's history, it's here. Uh, it's just almost delivered in a odd package you wouldn't expect it in necessarily. Yes, <laughs> like I said, it's some of their heaviest shit, but it's also some of their weirdest and most experimental shit. And yeah, they like had said, no the, rules. The times they go atmospheric, they go oddly atmospheric, and you're like, okay. Like I said, it's not your fucking classic metal album um and some of y'all might be like man it's you know as an album y'all could probably knock it out of your top however many and some of y'all could have this probably be your favorite and i could say it about almost every album but this one especially just because this could go eat anyway so the production's everybody. thick it is raw but like i said i think it's the most perfect one of the most perfect raw recordings it's the most, you can have man I think it's it, it might not be the most abrasive songs but it's their most abrasive tone yeah had. uh some fun facts about this record, too. Uh, this track number four, which is titled Four, uh, originally wasn't supposed to be on the album and was a song that was written for the Duplantier's mother uh, originally. And also the man on the cover uh, artwork for the album is lead guitarist Christian Andrew <laughs> as well. Well, and I know they use their sister in a lot of the music videos. Yes. Uh, and she does a, a lot photog- of ph- photography, photography for him, yeah. Which funny thing I looked on when I looked on Wikipedia, just Gabrielle, like for, yeah, Gabrielle Duplantis, and uh, the only uh, things listed under culture for their home township of Andres is uh, the Duplantis family. Essentially, their dad being an architect, the Duplantis brothers being a Gojira, and their sister who's a photographer. Well, yeah, no. Apparently, there's also like some other like artists of some sort that's from their township, uh, but that's all that's listed there's not much listed about andres it's like it's a cool place to surf it's in the southwest of france go jeers from there <laughs> on a side note I, i've done this i think 
or I've talked about possibly like talking shit like like this. I did this on the last episode too. I need to quit fuck with that. <laughs> Dropping shit again. But uh, Goddamn. Uh, if I could put a live record somewhere, the link alive, which is like all the best tracks from the link and Tara, and that's it. But it's just most piss and vinegar energy you could possibly have in a Gojira set. Yeah, it is so sick. Early Goji, early, early. So Gojira. that if if that qualifier was in here, that would be probably my number three, just because it's the best of both those worlds in one live set. But uh, yeah, so we're here, Terry Incognito, number three for me. Terry Incognito. Uh, so I suppose we should go on to my number three now. I guess. Uh, don't do it again. I don't want to talk about mine right away. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Oh, uh, well, what is my note three? Hmm. Because you only got two and one left, right? Mm-hmm. I don't know if this one's going to be in your top two. Okay. Uh, see, my, and just for it, so I got my number three, and just the note from here on out, these, the my top three records, I would consider nines, possibly tens, like for all three of these upcoming records. Uh, and my number three happens to be the, uh, first taste of Gojira that I got, actually. And that would be their 2012 album, La Enfant Sauvage. Uh, yeah, this works out good. Yes. <laughs> Number three, La Enfant Sauvage. Uh, it was their major label debut record that came out on Roadrunner Records. It's their fifth album. Revolver ranked it as the second best album of the 2010s. Uh, I don't know what the number one list was on the list. I didn't look it up. But uh, it could be any number of things, but... It had to be something pretty good to beat out this one. Uh, this album was where I really, well, okay, it wasn't the album where I really started, in retrospect, started really respecting Gojira. And this was one before I started like doing the research for this list. Uh, I thought it was going to be on the lower end of my list, just because I wasn't as familiar with it as most. I knew the singles, but I didn't really know the whole thing. Uh but this, for a long time, this had the one Gojira song, which is my favorite, that I knew him by, was the title track on this one, uh, Land Fought So Much. Because that one, that one song has everything I like about the band in one tight, neat little package there. Because it starts off with just heavy, fast-paced riff, and it goes into this super, like, cool, atmospheric, uh, I'm not sure what you'd call it, like the guitar, so it's just like this, uh, it's not tremolo. But it's a uh, very busy guitar riff that's like acts as a rhythm, like for like a melodic part of the song without being like a t- like a like a really prominent lead. It acts as atmosphere. Uh, yeah, for I don't know what the actual term for that is either, but I, I know I don't know what part you're talking about. Um, yeah. yeah, it's kind of like a it's kind of tremolo with like a fucking hiccup in it yeah it's it's, it's a weird off time type sweet. of like riff thing and like the thing with that one is that uh it's the thing that ha- it has a lot of this because it has like mario's drumming is on full display of being as prominent as it is uh, has one of the best breakdowns of any song i've heard ever um like in this one because wow. it's where like the gajira pick scrape is like prominent which is their one of their trademark things they do uh and this is one where that really highlighted one of my favorite things about gajira is uh Joe's screaming style, uh, especially this, because what he does is that he finds the perfect balance between aggression and emotion with how he screams on this. And in this one, it's definitely, uh, especially with the lyrics on this one, it definitely like it's real prominent because this being the title track, the uh, title of this album is inspired by like the story of the French feral child whose uh, name I don't know if I wrote it down in my notes here, but. Yeah, I didn't write any notes, but it was like there was like a really note one of the most well documented feral children that was found in France in like the mid eighteen hundreds, somewhere around that period. And essentially like the how it related and inspired this album was uh basically Joe talking about uh humanity's connection to like while that child is being feral and like considered to be separate from society, he's more in touch with nature than pretty much any other human around. And it's kind of like a weird trying to find your balance with like nature and like how you deal with humanity. And such. That's a concept I've actually like randomly stumbled upon myself a couple times when we like demonize people uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, I know that's like a fucking stretch there, but like 
how far removed are we from animalistic integrity? You know, because yeah. um, that concept to me kind of fucks with me a little bit. Just because you know we judge people on the human side of things as we should, but it's like you know why why do we not put more thought into just like man maybe maybe we're closer to that animalistic fucking thing than we like to admit that we are as a whole. Yeah, like it's be We're still territorial. We're still, you know, we still have those things in us. It's that, kind of like the feral child is like all of those things that we still are without the bullshit in between. Yeah. I mean, he's like the he's like the bridge, you know. And uh really interesting thing with this one also like Joe like was first became a parent on this album as well, so that also probably tied into it with thinking about like humanity and like our place in the world, like and our existence and such. Uh, but yeah, like the thing about this one, like they like did this album with Josh Wilbur, who's like a prominent producer who's worked with a lot of bands, uh, like Deftones and uh, some other no band. Like he's uh, one of his most famous albums he did was Chocolate Starfish for Limp Bizkit. Uh, but essentially, like what they got him for was that on this one they wanted the focus for this record was for everything to sound big and epic, essentially trying to increase the scale of their album sonically uh, was the goal with this record. And they definitely succeeded because everything sounds huge. Uh, on this one, they have so many good tracks. I think like I've looked through like my Spotify playlist. I can see how many songs I've saved to my playlist. Uh, and of course you got like the opening, really opening four tracks are just, Heat, 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 explosion, LaFont Sauvage, Axe, and Liquid Fire, all back to back. Are just strong, heavy tracks. Mario's, like, drumming is, like, a standout. It's always a standout, but it's definitely prominent on this record. And you also have, like, the more atmospheric stuff, like Gift of Guilt. Uh, Mouth of Kala has some cool stuff. And Born in Winter is a very emotional, emotive, atmospheric song that leans on a proggy side. I would say um, two of my favorite Go Jerry songs ever are Gift of Guilt and Born in Winter. Those are two of mine. So it's like when it comes like this, there's, there's a lot of modes to go to here, but uh, there's as far as like they're ones that are like the proggy atmospheric songs with emotion. Those are two of the ones that stand out the most to me on this record as well. Uh, and really this one, it just has like all their best traits like wrapped up on this album and only beaten out by like my next two picks. Uh the only reason why, like, I was going through this, and this album went from being one that was, like, a little bit obscure to me because I hadn't listened to all of it to being, I was debating it as my number one for a bit. <laughs> like, because it, it hits you with every track back to back that I, I can't, basically, a way that I describe albums or try to rank them a lot of time or rate them when I'm doing, like, straight up album reviews is uh, the amount of good versus the amount of, like, how much good there is and, like, how little bad there is. Yeah. Essentially, if I'm like considering an album for like a perfect score, I try to see if there's any reasonable flaws I can find in it. And this one on top of my like next two are have like the least possible amount of flaws I can find with it. I think the only reason why this isn't like in my like top two is because like for these songs, it's really just like the songs in the next two records. There's a lot more ones that are like memorable as far as like just immediately yeah. for it. Yeah, and I'm not talking much about this one because I got to uh, consult with that later. Consult with that. <laughs> but yeah, this one, it, yeah, it's just such, they got like the big epicness and it gave like a little bit of uh, a taste of like where the band was going to go. I'm not really disagreeing with anything you're saying. But, oh, yeah. Uh, for, you know, podcast format uh, purposes, purposes, I got to shut the fuck up. <laughs> But yeah, like Land Font Sauvage, it's definitely one of my favorite Gojira records. Obviously, it's my number three. It's one of my record, seven so. favorites. <laughs> well, no shit, because they only have seven records. So it's <laughs> kind of hope it's, it's in, in there somewhere. But yeah, this is uh, definitely up there for one of my favorites. It's huge. It's big. Uh, it slaps you in the face. <laughs> uh, Crazy. It definitely brings the axe. I want to <laughs> come in your house, dude. <laughs> Keep talking like that. Yeah, but Land Font Sauvage. There's a reason why this gets rated so highly, and it's such the atmosphere. This is where like the emotional edge of Gojira really started uh, to like speak to me on this record. Uh, I didn't really like 
Yeah, but I haven't like looked through the concepts of a lot of the records. I mean, I knew that they talked about environmentalism and existentialism, philosophy, and things of that nature. But this is where, like, even though I didn't know the specific concepts, I could feel it emotionally, and especially like with the like the title track, which is my favorite one on this one. Uh, like talking about like hooky lines. There's line in like the, I guess you could call it the. There isn't a chorus on it on that song, but during like the spoken words parts or the pre-chorus. That's kind of repeated. There's a line where it just screams like the desire <laughs> on that one. The yeah. desire. And I'm like, yes, this, this fucks. So yeah, much. Like he, he, he says one word way more impactful than a lot of people say a lot of words. Goes yes. back to that one note from Amazon. Yeah. <laughs> yes, which uh, I was very salty. Uh, I don't remember if they played this when we saw them last year. Uh, they definitely didn't play it the first time we saw, well, first time I saw them at Lot of the Life 2017. I'm blanking. I thought they played at least one song off each record, so I thought they played one fine. I think they did play this one. And I was like, hype as fuck, because I was like, yes. I probably get to hear this live. Uh, and I was screaming along with it, uh, getting almost as hype as you punched me in the chest when they played <laughs> fucking World Ocean Cup. Planet. Ocean Planet. And I was like, ow, you fuck. <laughs> like, what you get, dude? I, I spilled Anthony's beer. You spilled his beer, punched me in the chest, and you were just like freaking Ric Flair hopping like, and making your own circle in the pit. Uh, but we'll get, I'm sure we'll have more details on that one later <laughs> in, <laughs> in this list. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, my number three is Lay and Font Sauvage by Gojira. 2012 record, their fifth one. It's good. Listen to it. Well, now you got me wondering because... I didn't think we'd have a mutual top two. I'm thinking we might, though. I don't know. I was thinking we might have a mutual top two, but I don't know. I'm doubtful that it's going to be in the same order is my thing. Well, it's okay to be wrong. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, so my number two was the moment that I kind of made reference to earlier where I was like, oh, no. Am I tired of my favorite band? Is my favorite band just doing things I don't like anymore? Are they fucking, you know, are they on the way out? Like, there was, uh, there was not, I mean, it wasn't the same energy when it came out uh, that I had for other things when they came out. Uh, I kind of described how we, you know, waited so eagerly for, you know, the single on my space for The Way of All Flesh and, you know, this, that, and the other. And you've heard me talk about some of these other albums and, you know, my enthusiasm around them coming out, but like this one, um, I remember, I'm pretty sure the first single, uh, and the second single pretty much exemplified the heavy parts of the record. And then there wasn't really that much beyond that. Um, I mean, it still got heavy, but it definitely, um, was a change of pace. It was a shift. I loved the first two singles, and then I heard the whole album, and it was just like, okay, well, they kind of duped us a little bit. And like I said, I had a lot of, I won't say negative feelings, just puzzling. I was thinking about it. I was like, man, you know, is this, this is the fucking one where I jump off the wagon a little bit, but uh, the, my number two, so clearly I didn't, is uh, Magma. Magma, the 2016 record. Um. This one currently also their most popular album streaming wise. This one um, didn't really hit till, <laughs> funny enough, the uh, day my dad died. Um, fucking it! It kind of clicked. I uh, I got in the car with my buddy Andrew, and I knew that I wanted to hear this album. And for an album that I described to you the way I just described it to you. Why would I want to do that? Well, I knew leading up to the release of this record, they had actually scrapped a record and rewrote this record after the passing of Mario and Joe's mother. Yes. Um, I don't know why. And I, I it, it just, I told Andrew pretty much shut the fuck up. <laughs> and we put this album to, on to drive down to my dad's bar to have a drink with uh, Jason Groves, Chad Gravitt, and Josh Flowers. Crazy trio of people to see on that night. So, and from that moment on, like, this record just resonated on a different fucking plane uh, of existence with me. Um, and really, like, I could go into, like, the details of it, but honestly, like, there was just a shift that night where I was just like, all right, I, I, I just... I understood it all of a sudden. Um, the shooting star is very, um, 
you know, when you're talking about setting the mood for a record and it's pretty much talking about a body transcending into the astral plane and (laughs) going through the stars and stuff. And, you know, just pretty much like the travels of a, of a spirit. And then, um, you know, and I was going to the, 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 the concept of the, the mantra I was talking about, uh, with, the the song Silvera and the lines, when you change yourself, you change the world. And, uh, that one has only <laughs> gotten more true as time has gone on. Uh, cause I just know that like the more I've been introspective and the more I've worked on myself and, you know, being on a physical journey the last year and having some injuries and working through those and fucking becoming a better human all in all my fucking point of view of all things I look at is in a much more beautiful light and a you know better place. Um, the vibe of the record as it goes on, um, you know, like in Lowlands, like I, I fucking adore that song too. Uh, I don't even know what the fuck he's saying to French in it either. But <laughs> he's, uh, he's, Lowlands he's, is <clears throat> it's the one that's the acoustic guitar one, or no, nah, the Liberation is the closer, liberation, and goes, then yeah. uh, Lowlands is what, what what leads into it. Um, right, right. But this is kind of like the album that they were doing. <laughs> The shit I fell in love with before I fell in love with it. Like, it's it's kind of fucked up how it works. <laughs> like, my music taste went this way, but it wasn't necessarily because of them initially. Like I said, it almost took me two years to really, like, love this record, uh, which is crazy, <laughs> considering how much I love this fucking band and, like, my enthusiasm for each release. Um I just, like I said, I, I could go into like greater detail on like the songs and this, that, and the other, mm-hmm. but like I can really only go off the meaning. And like the only, you know, the only reason this one gets beat out is because the other one has such a grander scale of meaning <laughs> uh, when it comes to, to all things music and, and my life. Uh, but yeah, man. Um, plus, I've tripped a lot of pause and watch these music videos. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's good stuff to trip to. Yeah, the fucking shooting star video is fucking awesome with all the like the filters, them coming in and out of like the fucking hazy psychedelic shit and back into like just black and white. The sale is a crazy music video. That, that is cool. Like, That's crazy drum track. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, um, and I would just say this is like them really becoming the songwriters that they like I feel like this is the one where the songwriting really fucking took off. Like this, the, the, that was the focus. It, in a lot of in a lot of ways, it's probably their simplest. It's probably their most stripped down. It's probably if you're talking about metal purist people, they'd be like, eh, whatever. Like this one, man. And honestly, like they, this, I like this one more. Like Fortitude makes me like this album more almost because they took this like extreme like push this way from what they were doing because considering like the heavy shit like i said they do they have their parts where they go for it on this album like uh uh, only pain (laughs) it goes fucking hard Uh, and and, like the cell goes fucking hard uh but like really i mean you're talking about like the most stripped down effort they've put that put out and i almost welcome that again uh, I feel like Fortitude was them kind of bringing it back, as I said, to like a little bit of all the things. Um, I, I know, actually, I wouldn't mind their direction going heavier or crazier or like coming back a little bit. I just think that this is, but I don't know if they can replicate this with the circumstances that led to it. Um, so that's my only, I guess, concern with that. Tragedy but, does breed good art a lot of the time. But no, this this album, like I said, man, it uh, I mean, as Gojira always has, but it's it's it it, it made life easier at a time that it was absolutely fucking miserable. So <laughs> that's my endorsement for Magma at number two. Well, fun fact, uh, like in an interview, Mario said that uh, they are planning to go in a heavier, longer direction for the next record. Hey, bring it on. So the for all the people Gojira fans have been like, where where's my heavy? Where's more of the heavy? You you, you might get it. Like that ever went away. <laughs> it, it never really went away. They never fully dropped the heavy. They just added more to added more melody rather than that. Uh, yeah, uh, I suppose I should go with my numero dos now. And uh, 
with my top two picks, I these could switch honestly, like at any time, just depending on the day. I had a lot of trouble deciding which one of these is going to be which for my top two. Uh, and it was kind of like difficult. I think that like my two top two albums, which I have a good idea. Actually, I have an obvious idea what your number one is. I think anybody listening better fucking <laughs> can easily figure it out. Uh, and I think that like my albums are where they are for similar reasons to why your albums are where they are. And for me, thy number two album is from Mars to Sirius. It's okay to be wrong, Dante. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were going to say so like this, because I knew if there's going to be any point of conflict, it would be this spot here. Uh, and honestly, for Mars the Serious, I was like, when I first started like re-listening to the albums for where I was going to place this, I was going to, for a good long listen to this, Mars the Serious was going to be my number one. Uh, and I was kind of like, there's a part of me that was going like, come on, like, am I going to have the obvious like thing that everybody picks as the number one? And it was for a long time. It was there, uh, but like I'll get into reasons why. Like it's not the why. Like the number one is where it is when we get to that one. But for Mars is Serious, this is the album that is widely considered the best Gojira album by most of the fan base. Uh, it's the one they broke through on. It's the one that a lot of people discovered Gojira on, like early, on, like the breakthrough point of their career. It's. Still takes up the majority of their live sets. It does take up the majority of the live sets. It's still like amongst their most popular material. It's their second most popular album streaming wise. Uh, no, yeah, it's their second most popular album streaming wise. Like their tracks in the top five, Flying Wells is number three, Heaviest Matter of the Universe is number four, uh, for the most popular tracks. And it's easy to see why, because this album is fucking amazing. Uh, I could easily give this a perfect score of 10. And, like, it'd be hard to fault anybody that also thought the same, I would think. Uh, of course, this album, it's just, when I heard, I'm sure that, like, at the time this came out, uh, and even now, today, it still holds up. Not anything really sounds like this record. Like, uh, it's has so many, basically all the things that make Gojira Gojira are found on this record and polished to the nth degree essentially it has the heaviness it has the technicality it has the brutality but it has the sense of scale epicness and an atmosphere that like makes them them uh like this is like the the, the something that's really interesting to me as i was going through i listened when i was doing my re-listens of these albums i did it in chronological order from terra incognita upward to the newest album fortitude and the leap in quality from like the link and really not just like the link in style i mean the jump in style really and like where they were trying to go with their sound from the link to from our series is pretty wild in a two-year span and even if you take like the link out of the in between like the leap from Terra to that because you know again we were talking about, like the riff salad and like you know what Terra was and like how diverse it was. It was just like, and I, I said it was all the things Gojira that Gojira would do, but like that's yeah, it's like completely flipped on his fucking head. But it's all the, I mean, it's it's crazy where that jump and that leap went from. Um, and I'll talk more about the link here shortly, um, obviously, because we'll cover why shit's not in our top five. Yes, but like for them to go through their most rhythmic like acrobats because like fucking the link's insane link is quite insane um but it's like all rhythm all rhythm all rhythm that's pretty much like the crux of that album so yeah the leap from that to this is night night and day it's crazy like a lot of the time when a band has this Goddamn Nats in his fucking room. <laughs> just kidding, not to, okay. Uh, fucking Nats room now. Anyway, like the thing with a lot of metal bands, a lo- basically a lot of bands that start off like in the, some branch of extreme metal or like all screamy vocal type stuff or mostly rhythmic stuff. When they try to go melodic, there's usually a period of growing pains. Like when they're trying to induce melody into their sound and track one <laughs> says yeah 
here's the heaviest shit you've ever heard <laughs> with some fucking melodic atmosphere, <laughs> you yeah. know, like because like I remember like we're just gonna do it back and forth the entire song. Because like I knew like the singles from this record, I knew like Backbone, I knew Heaviest Matter of the Universe, but I remember one of the times on one of the many drives we've done as a band, you said, "Hey, put Prime Mars Serious on," and that was recent, yeah. And you put like like uh, Ocean Planet on. And I never really, like, I don't think I gave Ocean Play, like, a real listen. I mean, I've listened to it, like, it was just years ago when you first did it. Because uh, there's been many Gojira listens in the car. So yeah, give me tours. drunk. It's Sabbath and Gojira every yeah. time. Sabbath, Gojira, Nazi. There's a lot of that going on. Uh, but, yeah, I just, we were just thinking, like, you hear that opening riff. And it's, there's so many what the fuck moments and songs through Gojira's career. But I could just imagine in 05 you hear that for the first time and you go what in the hell is this never mind that whales pop out of your speakers <laughs> like you're you're the kid that buys the cd of disc jockey you put it into your little walmart six disc changer with the extra bass boost kick that motherfucker in <laughs> I, I had it turned boost. all the way I, I had that motherfucker cranked all the way on 30 that's where the number was I need to get high and listen to this record. But honestly. yeah, no, it fucking it hit, and when it hit, I was just like, "What the fuck was that? Why do I love it so much?" <laughs> you know. Yeah, this is a for those aware. Well, this is a concept record, essentially about a uh, planet uh, going. That's fine. It's something about like basically a, like a tr- time, not time travel, but traveling to make. A, it's about nature. <laughs> it's, it's a lot about nature. A lot about. No shit, Dante. No. Yes. Uh, basically, a lot of the concepts that Gojira is known for are well established on this record. There was weird uh, interviews back in the day where Joe said he would actually envision whales floating into the venues as they were playing and shit. Sure, he wasn't in the gym. I mean, I'm sure he's done something. He's a, like, he, like there's, he's their nature hippies. They had, they surely. Did I've watched them. that album cover dance for me. <laughs> like those planets would had an active atmosphere and that whale just kind of swayed back and forth all gently while I was tripping balls. <laughs> That's another reason. I'll, I need to let you say your piece. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I know that. Yes, I know. This is your favorite band. I'm really curious on how their album rank is going to go after this. Cause we covered like the two big bands who are like each of us. Well, two of the biggest bands for each of us. We're retiring it after this. One. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Uh, but yeah, this record, like, Listen to it all the way through. I listened to it at least like four or five times recently as like for the research for this episode. And it's, there's so much good on this record and like just seeing like how production stands up amazingly. Yes. The production quality is top notch. Uh, I remember I did have a funny moment with the song world to come because years ago in the early stages of our band storm toker, uh, we David had the idea that we should try to cover that song. And, yeah, uh, like I just remember Anthony still don't know how to work a looper pedal. No, he, he does not. And it was not good enough. Such a challenge that like for a good while, I couldn't listen to the song because of the frustration of trying to play this simple ass, like seemingly simple ass song uh, effectively. And I thought I was like playing it right, but like this just doesn't sound right. This doesn't sound right. And I thought that when I listened to this thing again, I was going to just have that in the back of my mind, making me not enjoy it. But I was able to appreciate it again, just because the quality is just that high. Uh, they the, just the atmosphere they able to do like the the vibes that they established with this, while maintaining all the heaviness you would want as a metal fan, like all the riffs that you would want as a metal fan. But they have the the beauty, the atmosphere, the songwriting quality was where Another they first started doing it. Beautiful, minimal, fucking instrumental interlude. <laughs> yes, <laughs> unicorn. Oh, it, uh, something I meant to mention, like like earlier in this one, I noticed that on nearly every Gojira record, they have a uh, quota of one tribal song per album. <laughs> Essentially, is what they do. Uh, I, I noticed that Lily and Font Sauvage is like notably without a tribal song. It's the only one I think they don't have a tribal one on. Uh, but mm, which one are you throwing on this one? Uh, this one, I th- forget which one it was. I should have marked which one it was. Per I don't. Record. I don't think they have any like distinctly. It might have been, uh, I don't. Know, I don't want to like turn it on. And listen. Right I say because I know Tara has like the weird fucking drum things going on. Yeah, the link definitely had something on. No, it. the link is like almost 
two thirds that shit. Yeah. Because even when they're not doing that shit, that just sounds like where it's rooted from. Yeah. And then uh, I know uh, there was some tribal like interlude thing on uh, Whale Off Legend. Oh sure. yeah, no, there's definitely. And then then Fortitude, obvious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, like <laughs> I just thought it was funny that I started noticing. Oh, the one tribal song quota <laughs> for a thing. Uh, but yeah, this record is so good. It has like, of course, the most like some of the most iconic tracks, which of course some of the heaviest ones like Backbone, uh, Heaviest Man of the Universe, where Dragons Dwell is pretty heavy too. As top, I'd of that. love to hear that one live again. Yes, and uh, then you have the more atmospheric stuff, like from Mars, World, uh, fucking World to Come, uh, and the in- the opening part of Flying Far- Whales as well is like pretty spacey atmospheric one. It, it's 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 such a vibes album for a lot of it while also having it has like the heaviest of heavy and the like vibiest of vibey ones on this record to a polished degree that i can understand why i'd be like it's often ranked as one of the best albums of all time but especially of like modern metal for sure uh and how it kind of defines the band so well it made them the meme whale band that's not mastodon (laughs) besides mastodon uh, and funny that they tour together as well <laughs> with their two most iconic albums while being very whale themed. Oh, well, yeah. No. Whales are cool. Whales are cool. The, the, and trees are too. Yes. Trees, trees are and cool. whales. Trees, trees and, and whales. whales. Uh, Sunshines and lollipops. <laughs> but yeah, pretty much all the iconic things that make Gojira Gojira are found in this record. Like all the atmosphere, the technicality, the prog, the like atmospheric, like introspective lyrics, the nature lyrics, the everything that you like about Gojira you can find on this record. It was also the first record where like Joe's uh vocal confidence was really established on this one, where you got the emotional scream that he does that really makes the lyrics hit home that he's delivering. Makes you feel every word pretty pretty easily. Uh but just like one of the most unique traits about them, which for a lot of most bands that are popular, really having a distinct vocalist is the uh, thing that helps them stand out with Gojira, they ha- even if they didn't have Joe's unique vocal delivery, they have everything else about them. With like their instrumental style, their like song topics, their songwriting, like they have so many unique aspects that it's distinctly them is why they're one of those prominent bands of modern day and really and later on in history, most like will be known. Yeah. But yeah, that's my number two uh, from yeah. Mars to Sirius. Well, my number one is spoiled again. You've done this like the whole list. Nah. I mean, it's pretty <laughs> obvious. What I figured this we've already go- we've already pretty much established. Yeah, from Mars to Sirius. I'd be Might surprised be if favorite. this wasn't your number one. Yeah, which I mean, yeah, like I said, I've told the story already with the you know buying it, putting it on, all the revolver, you know, hoopla. Um, I actually saw a post in my memories. About seeing them a year ago, and I said I fucking woke up listening from Mars to Sirius and still got chills. And when you can do that after seeing a band seven fucking times and having all the excitement of all these new records, the beautiful thing about them is I don't feel like they've ever chased that high of that record. I feel like they've just stayed their course. They have kept doing their, like... They never like felt trapped by the popularity yeah. of the breakthrough of that record. So like, kudos uh, to them for that. Um, my other just like emotional shit, uh, awesome moments like throughout history. I remember my beach vacation when I was on in high school, and I didn't necessarily buy a bunch of weed yet, but I bought a bunch of weed. <laughs> And, you know, I was becoming an experienced stoner, and I just remember there was a full moon one of the nights, Yikes. and I was watching the high tide like roll in on me, and I just sat down with the fucking shit. It might have been a fucking eh, MP3 player, I'm pretty sure. I think I was beyond Walkman status, but fucking just sat down by this fucking beach and listened to World to Come and just like stared at the fucking. And like I said, this was just fucking weed, y'all, and I fucking was tearing up at just the scene and listening to a song like world to come which is literally you know like the lines a mirror for the sky you know talking about the reflections of the you know water you know and you're just looking at the gigantic ass moon reflecting off the ocean and you know you you, you, my teenage self thought everything that was happening in that moment was very fucking deep and it was you know it all is subjective to where you are and what you're doing and uh 
you know, um, I remember a song like Global Warming, fucking... That live video of them performing this is one of my favorite live yeah. performances of anything. They're, that song's pretty nuts. Um, but, like, the little line of, you know, we will see our children growing. Like, the hope that Gojira always holds on to, even when they're talking about pretty much the existential dread of the end coming. But there's always a fucking silver lining of hope. And if there's anything that I think, if anybody's followed me for any amount of time, that usually when I'm at my worst, I always try to wrap up with, but there's this or there's that to hold on to. There's always a light to fucking hold on to. And I, you know, can I say I it's one to one something I got from Gojira? Kind of hard to tell at this point, but it's definitely something that's been a common thread in my life. And, uh, Again, what I said with, uh, you know, fucking magma getting me through the worst of times. Like, this album's literally gotten me through all the bad times. <laughs> like, it's always any, there for you. Any bad time I've ever had, I could put this fucking on and go back to that fucking kid that's discovering heavy shit, really, for the first time. The heaviest of shit for the first time. It brings me back to a primitive, primitive, primitive state of being. And it's one of those things that's helped me maintain my childlike wonder for the musical world. It's given me fucking a lot to hold on to. And, uh, yeah, like I said, man, it's, it's weird when you like a band this much and they actually do have messages that lead to positive routes and that, you know, even if they're talking about the darkness, they always find a way to shine a little light on it. And, uh, that's pretty much, honestly, I uh, think a valuable asset that all people should probably work on a little bit is being able to shine at least a little light, no matter how dark it gets, because somebody's looking for it, you know? Your gyra breeds a lot of positivity. So, um, again, he pretty much said everything about every song on here I could possibly, you know, I fucking have been on mushrooms, tripping balls, crying while flying whales was happening in front of me. Uh Again, I knocked beers out of hands and fucking punched Dante in the chest <laughs> when Ocean Planet came on. Yeah, it was the was first a- time they played Ocean Planet since the first time I've seen them. So, you know, 14 years later, 13 years later, whatever it was, getting to hear that song again, which was like the moment that, like, like I said, I, I just remember distinctly just that riff and it just shifting like everything. Like, I just started listening to heavier and heavier shit. It was my gateway drug to more. Um, Similar to how Ozzy just got me into any of it. This got me into the rest of it. Um, and I can't say enough about that. And I think that experience, I mean, when you have a record that is revered by that many people as well, but it wouldn't have mattered if people revered it that way because it was already there for me. Like, it was an established thought that, you know, it didn't take a bunch of people, you know, confirming those thoughts with me. You know, when I was in high school, nobody fucking knew who the fuck they were. And I kind of tried to introduce as many people as I could. My first band covered Backbone. Horribly. I, I'd imagine that's uh But we tried. We made lifelong friends because we did it. Uh, that's how I met that's how I met Johnny Martin. That's how I met fucking Rob Riker. That's how I met a lot of those dudes. Uh, Rich uh, Rip Rogers from Succumb. Like I met all those dudes because they were like holy They're like, Holy shit, these kids are doing good here. <laughs> they didn't say we did it good, but like, holy shit, they're trying, you know. They're trying to damn this. Uh, but yeah, man. Um, I don't. The fact that I love it almost just as much to this day, I mean, it's just a testament to it. And that's really all I can fucking say about it. Um, like I said, I've kind of talked about this record ad nauseum already on this podcast without us doing this album ranking episode. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, no, from ours is serious. And just in general, Gojira, fucking thank you for existing for. A, a boy, <laughs> a I wild child, if you, you will. <laughs> uh, a very beautiful statement for the number one for David from Mars and Sirius. Uh, so it makes it, well, I don't know how, if it makes it obvious what my number one is or not, but uh, my I, number. I thought we'd had the same top two, so. We do have the same top two. Maybe not in the same order, but it was 
pretty close to it. My number one is the one that David already mentioned earlier, Magma. Is one. And I think that for me, with this record, really this easily could have been, the order could be easily reversed for these two. Because I like both these albums for similar but different reasons. Uh, and I think that the thing that gives Magma the edge for one, this is the first full album I listened to when I discovered Gojira for the first time. Um, back in 2016, I listened to it right when it came out. It was around when I first started reviewing albums was in 2016. And that was when I was first getting into, uh, or at least getting back into doing full album listens where you get the full idea of what a band is trying to convey with a project. And with this record, give it, I was late to the Gojira train and this is my first full taste of an album from them. So I was getting kind of like a different taste than everyone else did because they changed a lot from previous records with this one where they were focused fully uh will focus more on like melody elements and being a little bit softer than the tech death elements they had on earlier records uh but for this one some this is this is a good record for me to like jump on ship for them and really it's probably one of the easiest albums for most people to jump sh- jump onto the gajira train because this also happens to be the most popular record. Their two most popular songs are from this record, the singles Stranded and Silvera. Uh, one of them Grammy nominations for both those songs. Well, for this album, for like best rock album and for Silvera for best uh, metal performance. And it's because this is where they put their whole ass into the songwriting. They purposely wanted to make shorter songs, more accessible songs. And this is also their shortest album of any of the records at 43 minutes and 10 songs. So it makes it real easy to get into this one. The uh, songs are relatively short and sweet compared to a lot of their material. And I'd say that the only reason that this one is my number one as compared to from Mars is serious is because the song like being wrong. (laughs) (laughs) Now, like the songs are top notch for this record. Uh, They, very given like they have great songs for their whole career but these ones are like song to song to song very easy to get into uh they hit and also this is when i first discovered them so there's a little bit of like bias there for like the discovery thing uh because really like like a song like stranded stays with you like pretty easily with us like the chuggy riff the groove the uh the we-dee-dee-dee. Yeah, this is had a lot of the elements. They still had a lot of the elements that they had through their whole career. So the fucked up thing with them is they always kind of sort of do the same shit, but they don't. <laughs> they have the same like Gojira isms. Yeah, that they do. They have the pick scrapes. They have the weird pinch harmonics. Pin, yeah, they, the weird pinch harmonics. They, they, you know, their double pace parts are pretty similar in a lot of stuff. Like, yeah, now there's a. There's a lot of tropes, but it's funny how it doesn't. They don't seven feel like albums, they're repeating themselves. Ever. Seven albums and it doesn't wear thin. It's fucked up. Us. And this one, like, also, it's probably just because this is the album that I've had the most time with. But, like, this is the easiest for me to, like, look at a song title and remember what they do on each one of these things. Like, of course, you have, like, Silvera, which has just, it just sounds epic. Just, the like, the big riff, the, like, friggin' the, the, double time pace that they do like it's just very like it's paced well that song and of course like stranded has just a groove that's like built for arenas that's like everybody loves it's the most popular song streaming wise still yeah uh, some kid at work actually popped that one on i was like hey there you go there you go you listen to good shit there you go you ain't a piece of shit fucking little whatever generation <laughs> me bullshit what are they uh, what are they now if they're if, if coming they're out pre- of high school or that's high gen school. alpha yeah, gen- if they're like not college age yet, they're alpha. Gen D's, Gen D's, nuts. Gen D's, nuts. Dude. Uh, yeah, fuck y'all. But no, we props, also have props like- to Ginger Boy for listening to Good Year at Work. <laughs> and then, of course, you have like the other tracks, like Only Pain, which is just like it's a simple song. Like part of like looking at the like interviews for this album said that Mario struggled to try to make simpler drum tracks for this album. Uh, which is still not he that really, simple. I was say, he really doesn't. Uh, he says that, oh yeah, this I have to go simpler in this one. Like, this this, this was simple. For you to sell. Hello? <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, like, 
only pain is just like dun, 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 dun. it just it has like a good progression of going back and forth between like Which, the, I love how like the cell sounds like you're going insane before they finally can finally kick into the groove. Yes, it's just like that fucking constant. That's most of a sugar esque. And you're like, what the fuck? All right, all right, all right, and bam! It's like, oh, there we are. The cell sounds like as much of like a sugar song. Showing their sugar influence the most with that one because it sounds like totally like a Thomas Hawk type drum beat. Sounds like a like a sugar type like intro and then it goes full Gojira with the grooves that well, leans into it well and that's crazy is like a lot of their concepts are simple it's just the execution is fucking fucked yes like a lot of the guitar shit actually is not that hard it's that's just what I was so tight and precise and like their shifts and like how they go from riff to riff because i'm thinking like i'm not a guitarist i'm a drummer uh so i can tell you all day about how like complex mario's stuff is but guitar wise the thing that always struck me with them is that like it sounds like the actual riffs and notes aren't that complicated it's just how they're strung together the time signatures that they do picking the wise the picking wise they're in the joe's insane like the the shit that they come with and how he picks it out because again a lot of it will just be like but it's yeah. just the fact that they'll pick it out and be so perfect and it's like they'll extend those parts out so damn long where it's just like how are you even lasting that long to get through that lots of jerking off and then uh <laughs> lots of whale porn uh, uh <laughs> but but yeah no that's a because I, I, i've tried to learn some songs they're like they're more complicated songs and it's just like i take pride in not needing a pick I can't play that shit unless I fucking became a pick player. Well, their basis uses a pick. So. Well, well, I'm just saying, like, there's other bands that I I can translate, or like parts I can translate them. I just don't think it's possible, like just with the precision picking that they they employ. Like I said, the the, the band itself, there's a lot of shit that's like like I said, super fucking simple. But like in the in the context of all of it, and just how they structure shit, and like how they shift stuff it's nothing simple about it i mean fuck toxic garbage island has a fucking wonder if in particular just it's almost like a waltz and it's like again easy fucking concept but then it fucking goes into the crazy drum shit again and they shift into the you know something else and it's just like i said good luck picking that good good luck picking that precisely good luck fucking doing any of the shit that they do yeah like this one like but essentially, like, this one's, like, my number one because it has, like, n- I mean, given, like, the last top, my top three records have, like, no, almost, like, no, really no fat on them. But with how trim they made this album, it has, like, the least fat. And it's, like, all all killer, no filler. <laughs> the, make a, like, reference. Which there. it's crazy how short for Mars the Serious feels at an hour six. Yeah. Which, it does not feel like an hour six. Because I listen to that whole, that record all the way through listed, and, like, that one feels not as long as because like marginally shorter than hour six yeah like if a record goes over an hour like usually it's like it's a, it's a struggle for me like 50 minute record. marks hard yeah like, it's 45 like, is like perfect long like if it's a prog band i can like get down with it i think part of the reason why i go Jared gets away with it so easily without a feeling to us because they put in enough straight up banger riffy riffy songs to balance it out so it doesn't well, feel like a drag. And even if they, you know, if there's a song like Flying Whales where it's the interlude is like two minutes and they don't repeat it. They don't come back to it. They, you know, just go through this fucking riff, riff-tastic song, you know, after that. So it's how they structure shit, too. Yeah, they do, like, a real good job of, like, just putting... They're, like, essentially their, like, composition, like, skills are just top-notch. And for them trimming stuff down, like and going in a softer direction for Magma, uh, they still manage to keep all the elements that make them Gojira while kind of like exploring newer directions. And you said it's 43 some. minutes? Yes. Yeah, and that's a bite size 43 minutes. It's not. Yeah, I feel, that I, feels quick. When I was saying the 45 minute mark being like, you know, a good length as far as like being a long record and being fine. Yeah, now 43 minutes. To, for them, seems like it goes by in like twenty. It's it's not built like other bands. And given this is like fewer songs than most of the records, because like for Mars Serious is twelve songs, uh, and Magma's ten songs, which makes it a lot tighter. Uh, bringing like so like forty two, the newest ones eleven songs, but fifty one minutes. Uh, 
And then you got something like, we have all flesh is a bit of a cheat because like that one has like yeah, a 17 minute we, one. That, that, that's why you don't do that. Because yeah. when we try but to even, podcast and talk about how long your record is, we don't want to deal with that shit. But even with, if you took that out, like it's still like an hour five for uh, Way of All Flesh. And uh, that one's a breezy that's hour. That's 12 songs. And that's still a breezy hour. Like it doesn't get too long in the tooth. It goes by pretty quick. But uh, yeah, oh, well, I guess the link is only slightly longer. That's like 47 minutes at 11 songs. Uh, but yeah, Magma is my number one because it's just got the it's got the songs that like stick with you and you don't have to listen to it too many times to really get into it and also it's when i first discovered the band it's kind of like what helps it be my number one but really from mars is serious i don't knock anyone for having that as number one and it's honestly could be my number one i'll say you said three records could have been your number one yeah there's only one that could have been mine because it was the right answer dante not to (laughs) there's no there's it's all music is subjective (laughs) if someone wanted to put (laughs) <laughs> like one of these other ones out as the number one. No, nah, I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't. Shit, I wouldn't have bitched if you had the two I um, don't have on the list as your number one. So that's nice. fine. Which I guess that's the next section here. Like do our both our like that was each of our top fives that we had on the list here with magma being my number one. And we'll breeze through this a little more. Nice. Yeah, we'll we'll breeze through this. This is this shouldn't be as long because this is actually gotten a bit longer than I expected, but. I'm telling you, yeah. It's Gojira. I expected it to go yeah. longer than normal. Our municipal ace one went an hour 20. <laughs> yeah, we didn't have nothing to talk about. <laughs> we had nothing to talk about. We just were jerking off. Essentially. Um, so uh, we got like you two albums. Go each. with the mutual one or you want to go with the differing one? Uh, let's see. Which, so what were the two albums that you didn't have on your top? I know that one of them was The Link. And, and Love, Haunt, Love Haunt Salvage. So, yeah, that, that one. I'm surprised that one wasn't in your uh, um, top five at all. So that goes if, to me. It, there's not as much. So with that being between the way of all flesh and being between magma. Yeah, I noticed that you I haven't heard you talk about that record much. It kind of, and it's tattooed on me too, so that's funny. But <laughs> it kind of falls in the category for me of where they came from and where they're going and it being not as to me again some of my favorite songs that Gojira have and I said that earlier Gift of Guilt and Born a Winter two of my favorites um, but like the big singles didn't stick with me like all the other big singles did so like the top of the album that they were promoting is the top of the album you know the explosions the acts and uh, Lenfont, which in Lenfont still holds up, but that song fucks way too hard. <laughs> to I just like if I had to say like, all right, what do I think their weakest opener is? It might be Explosio. Like you know, I I can agree with that yeah. honestly. So and then uh, I like Explosio a lot, but like out of even like those three, that's the one that sticks out the least. So like the and like all right, so like the problem where I had like with Terra, where I was like, well, I don't can't like really talk about which songs are which in the middle in the meat of it kind of that same way after the eggs or after the wild healer actually it's like the songs leading into gift of guilt i'm just kind of like not as strong on just not as strong on uh again like i said i think it's just the history of the band and me liking the band as long as i've liked the band i just feel like that was like like i said there was a where they came from and where they're going kind of dichotomy going on and it just kind of fell a little flat after i got away from the newness of it i kind of felt like this is a transition album for them as far like as their this nerves. is actually p- number seven okay. like if i had to extend the ranking out and uh and again there's nothing really that wrong with it i still love it, love it. like it's really me nitpicking like a motherfucker like a, compared to what i'm loving right now and again fucking three weeks from now i might put this record on again like fuck <laughs> i fucked up dante i think you gotta put it on again because this is my number three so obviously i'm gonna I'm now, this, this is actually one of the ones i went back to make sure True. um because like I said terra incognita was the one that kind of surged and i was like oh yeah okay that one that one yeah i was expecting terra incognita to be my number five originally and the way of all flesh was very hard to keep off because i just yeah because that was the first well, I know that's another one tattooed on you, and I expected that to be somewhere in your top five. Well, Way of All Flesh was four. 
I am West Virginia, sorry. So I'll, I'll mix it up. <laughs> so you didn't have fortitude on there. Yes. Which was actually kind of a surprise to me. I knew that that was going to be the surprise one for that. And this actually was a surprise to me as I was going back listening through the records. Because uh, I expected fortitude originally just like before I did my re listens. Uh, I knew, I figured fortitude was going to be at minimum on my top five just because it's one that I've listened to. Out of all the records, it's one I've listened to the lot because it's oh, just man. during my review. And that might go in the recency bias pile too, <clears throat> like the reverse recency bias Possibly. that I was talking about. But before, it's like, like it's the newest one, so yeah. yeah Let well, me but, give it less credit than I want to give it credit for. Yeah, but with Fortitude, like I was, uh, for me with this one, like I was thinking that it was going to be like at four or five, really, at first before re listens. And I realized something when I was doing my re listens. Like, of course, they, with this, with Fortitude, they front loaded the hell out of this record. Like, yeah, they, they did. Cause like, of course, they definitely did. We had another world a year before the album came out. We were hype as shit on that. Cause we both listened that same day together. Kind of like on that one. Hype as fuck for it. Uh, then born for one thing came out. Play that song to death. Like gladly. And the music video was cool. The song was cool. Rick and Ma- Mario's ghost note playing in that song is epic. Yeah. It's like the last four songs do Peter out. Yeah, that was like, the thing. Like, I'm that. good all the way through the chant, and then, like, usually I'm, like, over it after the chant. Yeah, usually, like, I'd say this is their overall, their softest record, and the pacing of it is kind of, like, the, it's really the sequencing. It's kind of, like, what hurt it a bit, I think. Uh, and, like, like, because, of course, like, the first three songs, Born for One Thing, Amazonia, and Other World, are three of my favorite all time Gojira songs. Uh, but then after that, it gets really into. Like a lot of like the trippy melodic stuff, and it kind of goes into like it's still good. There's no bad Gojira records to me still. Yeah, but this is my number seven because they kind of go into real kind of leading into hippy dippy did some ayahuasca and like smoked too much weed and went That's real so soft sad. in this one. That's why I love it. <laughs> uh, it doesn't really have like another heavy heavy moment till Sphinx. Really, and then grind is insane, and grind, yeah. But I just feel like those last four songs are not nearly as strong, and I don't think they have another part on another album that drags that hard. Yeah, that's a stretch of like. But I just love the all the way through the chant so much that I had to put it. Yeah, like the chant took me a few listens, even on the first my first listen to this record back in twenty twenty one. Then you synced it live. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I mean, it was really great to see live. That's a lot of these songs translate way better live than they do on album. I think uh, that's just songs in general, honestly. Yeah. Uh, but this one, it's still a good record. But I feel like with the bar set so high for Gojira, they kind of they can do a good record, but good's not the level that you normally associate with. Gojira. You associate them with amazing uh, for most of their material. And especially going this melodic, I think I have the feeling with this record that I did with uh, what most old school Gajira fans had when Magma first came out. See, I feel like it was more on the heavy side than Magma. But it it might be a, I don't know, I feel like they didn't have as much heaviness because like Magma, of course. I do think this one gets a little lost in the sauce with the hippy dippy shit, though. Like it, it, it It does, but I like that shit, so I'm not complaining about it but i could see your complaint there i'm just surprised that given because we worn it out too we have worn it out and this is like a lot of mutual listens with this one. so that goes that goes to the recency like i said i, I think both of us may have a little bit of the reverse recency bias where we're like eh, yeah. all of a sudden after loving it because me ranking at number five i think when it first came out i fucking was like ah oh, this is awesome it's yeah i thought that i was wondering if fortitude i knew that it wasn't going to be your number one because from our series so yeah. but i was curious how high fortitude would hit no, on your list no, i love the record it's it, that so like i said i would say like Terra surged up that one dropped everything else pretty much stayed about the same yeah um, mine switched all around honestly. so and then the elephant in the room the, the mutual l- one the link, link. Uh, which i think for a lot of people is an incredible record still yes I think for a lot of people, this will be my number six. Rhythmic fucking gymnastics the entire time. Yes. This might be, like, if you're going to learn a record, might be the hardest one to fucking play. Like, they, the the breakdown of remembrance is fucking insane. 
the way they count throughout this record is insane. Like the shifts in this sh- shit is insane, but it has like almost none of the rhythmic quality or none of the melodic qualities that really rounded out Gojira. It's like they devolved into the link. This but one. when they devolved into the link, they, like I said, they created this fucking rhythmic masterpiece. Like it is by far. <sighs> <laughs> I mean, if I'm talking like my top 25 records of all time, it might still get in there, even though it's my sixth favorite country record. Yeah, like, like I'm it's a- so good, but it just the production is squished. Yes, this is the first record they did in their own personal studio. Uh, and Joe himself has mentioned that they were not happy with the production on this record as well. And to be fair, it's not that bad. Yeah, I was but you're just comparing it to absolute greatness. Yeah, because like, sonically, when you're talking from ours, series, and sonically, Fortitude's damn near untouchable, yeah, too. Fortitude's great sonically. Uh, and, and sonically, I mean, the, like, Magma. Like, the, the from ours, series, Magma, and I would say Fortitude sonically are like the the holy trinity as far as just... Production quality. Yeah, that full fucking yeah. what you want. And that's why, like, Way of All Flesh over time got dinged for me, too, because, like, it kind of took on that little quality where it kind of got squished a little bit. But yeah, this album's really that's really its biggest flaw. And like I said, it's just it doesn't explore the melodic realm of Gojira as much as everything to follow and not as much even as Terra did. It's like they kinda stripped that aspect out of them. So it's really hard to like put it over anything. The only reason I, I even put it over uh Linfont for me is just because the how rhythmically it stands out and the songs individually still stand out more to me top to front to back than uh Lenfant does but again the squish production it just like it it, it hurts for me not to put it higher because i think it's phenomenal but it's just it doesn't have all the things that gojira does well Yes, but this album for me, like, especially since I was listening to this in chronological... Mario's drums are fucking absurd on this record. It is pretty absurd. The uh, It never stops either. In fact, like, when I was researching, like, their comments on this record, uh, Mario was talking about how, like, he... I feel like he finally nailed playing double kick and blast beats properly with this record. And he was focusing intentionally on playing fast. Embrace the world. Freaking Wisdom Comes Wisdom is, like, comes. one of the nastiest fucking death metal songs I've ever heard. Just, they start off with just like the most gurgly death growls and blast beats. Really, I think like I know this is like the production. The guitar production was like my biggest problem production wise. This one, but the drum Dumbers production are nuts. Dude, yeah. uh, just it just has that punch. Just we we used to say that the opening line was "Truth's here for supper." <laughs> so that's, uh, that, that's been the joke with that song for as long as we can remember is Drew's here for supper uh, but he who learns must suffer that's the line but yeah I don't like I said I, I don't want to fucking extend this out anymore we got to on that but like yeah it's still an incredible record please go listen to the link yes it, I, I, it, I it's kind of like it's it's kind of just like lost in time to the rest of their career now yeah especially like Terra Incognita kind of is too but like but the link is special. Link, I see, like, in publications that do, like, their rankings of Goodyear albums, Link is usually the one that's at the bottom. And like I said, it's better than 90% of bands' best albums. Yes. People wish they could do what they did on Link. Yeah. And that's the record, that's the throwaway record for a lot of Goodyear fans, which is pretty wild. Like I said, it, that, and it's not throwaway at all. Like I said, that's the thing that pisses me off about having to rank this shit. This is actually the <laughs> hardest one, because, like, for me, it's not even that I feel like it has to be in the top five, but it's just how much I like it. And I can't put it in the top five because if you're just <laughs> really subjectively looking at it, you got to count production. Yes. You got to count the fact that they didn't do all the things that they're good at, you know, and stupid shit like that. I mean, it's just, you know, because like I said, what they do do on that record is absurd, phenomenal, yeah, and should fucking be cherished and loved. But they're never going to play any of that shit live besides the breakdown from Remembrance. And if they may pull out Remembrance all the way through again, I'm punching somebody else in the jazz. <laughs> So uh, there's that. So that's our thoughts on literally every Gojira album, pretty much. And uh, pretty much, yeah. Like that's every Yeah. So another edition of the podcast. 
Yeah, like good year. I think we went a little longer than we thought we were going to. We have gone. This is definitely one of our longest episodes. Where are we at? Uh, currently, we're at two oh eight. Um, All right, yeah, we don't need no fucking Q and A. We can save that for the next yeah. episode. That's why I was saying. I, I was just making reference to him. There was a little silence. I was trying to not say it, but then yeah. we kind of awkwardly paused there. I can I can cut that out. Yeah, we'll, <laughs> we're, we're going to cut the Q and A for this time, just because we went so goddamn long on this. Yes, but, there was a lot on this, and I think like and our Q and A wasn't that in depth, so we're just adding fluff at this point. But yes. we might start off maybe the next episode or something if we get to it. Potentially, depending yeah, we, what we decide to do, we'll figure out how we're going to do the next episode. Uh, we'll try to keep the next one a little bit uh, more like a uh, high and tight uh for the next one we've been saying it almost every time we say that it doesn't happen i promise one one day we're gonna have an hour-long episode i promise just we'll keep it tight to an hour uh but yeah like that was our uh favorite gojira albums in our top five order uh if you uh want to have a suggestion on what we should do an album ranking of next uh or if you have ideas on the pod yeah just ideas you want us to cover something do historical you, want to, you know to review a specific album do you want us to rank a certain band's albums that are favorites uh if you just want to send a question into the podcast so that we can read it out and answer it for you on an episode here or if you want your music played on the podcast which you probably heard earlier in this podcast uh i'm planning to do a horse burner for this episode yeah well it makes it even longer <laughs> so it does, it, it does make it longer goddamn q a uh, we thought about it but it was in the plans but yeah we've gone over two hours so we don't need to push this out more uh but yeah uh if you have a question want your music heard on a pod or want to make a suggestion on for something for us to cover uh just drop a line to uh the heavy haystack at gmail.com or dm one of the socials uh on either instagram at uh the heavy haystack facebook at the heavy haystack or tiktok also at the heavy haystack any of those work just as well i don't use twitter really i have a twitter account i, I don't use it so don't bother uh but yeah uh without further ado i'd say that's the episode so uh until next time tune in next week where we'll have an episode of some sort going on here uh potentially potentially we'll figure it out it might uh, not be next week but. might not be next week like i'll do something solo maybe in short potentially i still haven't talked about summer slaughter tour i still need to talk about that uh but yeah that'd say that's it so without further ado peace love music and we shall see you all next time god only knows what i'd be without you sure we'll, we'll go with that for an outro <laughs>